have not been to Clear Lake before. I've been as far as Mason City, which is basically Clear Lake, but I didn't come quite this far. I hear it's really beautiful, and people have called it a resort town, which I haven't been able to see yet, but maybe I'll get back to that. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my background, and uh, I'm really excited that Christina uh, is started the center here. Um, I worked, I coordinated the University of Iowa Autism Center uh, for a couple of years um, when it just got started. I'm now uh, a behavior analyst for College Community School District, which is in Cedar Rapids, um, it's called Prairie, uh, on the outskirts near the airport. And uh, I met her, actually met Christina, when I, about two years ago, I did a, a keynote on what I'm going to be talking about today, which is evidence-based practices. Uh, for uh, individuals with autism and we kind of met she just um, talked to me a little bit about her family and her sons and, and the challenges that she has and, uh, and then we met up a couple we met up about a year ago again at another workshop that I was doing and she uh, she said she'd gotten this this autism center going um, I was working on that and asked if I would be willing to come in and talk to the families here and so that's pretty much where um, how I got involved in this um, right now my background has gone, been really wide. Um, I started out actually as my first experience with autism was in recreation. Okay, when I was an undergraduate student, I worked with adults and children teaching them swimming. Uh, and I uh, had a lot of individuals with autism at that point and didn't really know that that's what, that they were on, um, had autism spectrum disorder. And then I went to, um, went to college and uh, got an undergraduate degree in psychology and wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with that. And meanwhile, I was a paraprofessional during that time in a school for um, kids with autism, in a public school. So I worked um, in a classroom, and I was lucky enough to have a really good role model as a teacher, and uh, decided that this was really something I thought I wanted to do, and I really loved this population. And so I went back and got my master's degree in special education, and I taught for uh, three years uh, in Colorado. I um, moved out west after I got my degree here at the University of Iowa. And at that time, I, when I was at the university, I spent a lot of time working um, in schools and inpatient units, outpatient clinics, um, really studying the field of applied behavior analysis. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what that is um, throughout, this inter throughout this presentation. Uh, basically, I was trained to work with individuals who um, have pretty severe challenge behaviors, uh, individuals with autism that were trying to teach skills get them to learn um, things like communication, social skills, um, sometimes ac academic, sometimes vocational life skills. Uh, and uh, that was a big part of my program. So I went off and I taught. And then I thought, I really like this behavior stuff. Um, I think this really works well. And I'd like to know more about it. So I came back to Iowa, where I was from, and I worked on my um, doctoral degree. And then I really emphasized on this behavior analysis that I'll, I'll talk to you about. So. I've taught um, in three different states um, at, the, at universities, and I've taught special educators to um, go out and teach. I've also taught um, psychologists who are, want to be behavior analysts and want to work with individuals with autism and other developmental disabilities. So I've kind of done a lot of things. I've coordinated centers. I've worked a lot with families um, tr talking about what kinds of services are needed. Uh, and now I've gone back to schools, which is what I love, and I'm full-time at College Community. and I. I have a big focus on training teachers and paraprofessionals there on how to work with individuals with autism and how to deal with challenging behaviors. Okay, so um, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about um, evidence-based practices, okay, and what kinds of things we should be thinking about using with individuals. But before I do that, I want to see who's in the audience because I heard I've got really a, a wide variety of folks. Um, how many parents do I have there out here? Okay. Okay, great. Do we have any paraprofessionals? Yay! I love you guys. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, how about um, other special ed teachers? Okay, teachers in general? Okay, yay, great. How about occupational therapists? Do we have any out there? I work with a lot of folks. Um, speech pathologists? Okay, grandparents? Okay, wonderful. Um, who have I missed? Pediatricians? Great, okay. Uh, is there anything, anybody else that I didn't mention that is here and wants to tell us who they are? Okay. Um, well, when we talk about working with individuals with autism, it's a very complex, um, I, I think, uh, disorder. Or, or, uh, and, and we tend to have to use a lot of people. Okay. So um, I like to hear that there are lots of people in the audience because I really think it takes families, it takes 
paraprofessionals, it takes grandparents, it takes um, pediatricians, it takes our speech paths, our educators, um, our occupational therapists. All these folks oftentimes are needed to help develop programs and to really work comprehensively with all the symptoms and the characteristics that we see um, individuals with autism display. All right? And so a lot of, some of the programs I will talk to you about are really comprehensive in nature and so they are really um, using or utilizing all kinds of folks for that. All right? um, I can multitask here. This is really hard. Can you hear me? I don't have this. Is this okay? No. Do you want it for the video? It'd be better okay. if you don't mind. I'm <laughs> sorry. This. this is so hard. Okay. I am not good at multitasking. That means I have to do something with my right hand, click, <laughs> and then I have to hold my left hand and try not to trip, which I've done that multiple times um, in presentations. So I'll do my best um, to try to do that. I also did mention that um, I, I have two nephews on, on, um, who have Asperger's. So that's sort of touched, I think so many people are touched by um, this in their families and I frankly, most of the people I know know somebody anymore who um, is on the autism spectrum. Okay, so enough about me. I want to have a number up here and I always try to start with this. Um, it's getting bigger and bigger every year. Three years ago it was um, five million. Uh, now I'm, I, I just did this yesterday. Anybody have any ideas about what this number is? How many people are diagnosed? How many people? Wow, that, that's a good one. No, that's not it, but I, I bet it's even more than that, maybe. Um, any other guesses? Yeah. The number of cases that they are going to be expected to be diagnosed this year. Okay, numbers again? No? Actually, what this is is when I Google and I put autism treatment, um, in the field there, and I hit the enter button, this is the number that comes up, okay? So, um, and the reason I always find this interesting to do, when I um, teach graduate students, one of their, um, I guess one of the assignments is that they have to go online, and they have to look and, and kind of look at some of the, the treatments that you see online and what's out there for families. Um, this number gets bigger and bigger every year. Like I said, three years ago, um, two years ago when I did this presentation, it was at five. Million, okay. The reason I put that and I start out with that when I'm talking about evidence-based practices or treatments or interventions is that this is a lot of information for families and for professionals, uh, for teachers to have to try to, um, I guess, go through and try to choose what should we be doing and what not. Okay? There is so much out there with the internet and I know that if you're a teacher you're having to talk to students all the time about good information on the internet and not so great information and how we go about doing that. Again, I just like people to kind of see, I, I feel for families, I feel for again even professionals when you're trying to figure out what should I be doing when I can go online and I can go in and see in the newspaper um, almost every day something about autism. Okay. So I oftentimes think about it as the autism treatment highway, okay, for families. So we've got ABA, if you go down that route, which is applied behavior analysis, okay, and we're, if you don't know what that is, I'll, I'll really talk to you a lot about that today. Video modeling, um, that's another intervention that's been used um, quite frequently and effectively. There's medication management, which we know can be very effective for some behaviors. Um, there's picture exchange communication systems. PRT is pivotal response treatment. Um, and SIT, Sensory Integration Therapy, okay? Have you heard of some of these? Have everybody heard of some of these interventions? How many of you, of your kids or people that you're working with are using something that's up here? Okay, all right, good. This is just a few things, all right? Um, there are so many other treatments and things that could be used, but I always feel like it's how do you navigate this from a parent's perspective or grandparents, and even from a professional per perspective, how do you tell your the folks that you're working with what to do? Okay, so what I hope to cover today is to really talk to you about what evidence-based means. Um, I was just asked that on the news, so hopefully I did okay. Um, why does it matter? Okay, why should we do this? Um, I was working with a, a, a team um, in the schools last week, and we were talking, somebody brought up a uh, an intervention that they were using. And I started asking, well, what are the behaviors that you are trying to change by using that intervention? And I wasn't able to get a whole lot of good answers. And so I kept kind of asking, and we were talking about this. I'm not going to mention what it was at this point, um, but it wasn't evidence-based, okay, which is why I was just trying to get a good idea as to why we were using this. And if we were, what we were trying to change. And I couldn't really get any answers. And so um, this person looked at me and she said, well, 
I don't know, it may not be evidence-based or it may not be scientific, but it's just, it just makes sense. And I had to kind of pause and think about that, and, uh, and, and that's a problem for me. Um, because a lot of times what we think is naturally the thing to do, or the thing that I naturally want to do, okay, when I think about learning and what I know about autism and, and what I know about treatment, what's natural, what seems to be common sense sometimes, is often counter-therapeutic. Okay, it's really not, and it's just, this is what we do by human nature. And I tell you that because I've done those things, and I look back at my career when I didn't, was just starting out, and I think about some of the things that I used, and the practices that I did, and I, I just really have to go, wow, you know, I would never recommend that right now. Um, I, I know better. So it is, um, it does matter, we're going to talk about why, okay? Um, we're going to talk about what are some of those, I'm really going to talk for the most part about the established treatments things that we have the most evidence for right now. I will also talk about some promising and emerging treatments, okay? Things that, um, treatments that are maybe don't have the high quality study or the, the number of studies out there yet, but they're looking pretty good, and we've got some evidence to show that they are helping with some behaviors, and so um, I think those are some things that you can think about. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about how do you go about making those decisions, okay? Where do you start as a family? you're just getting started, if you've been in this for a while, how do you, when do you continue with the treatment? When do you decide that maybe we need to try something else? Okay, and then just resources, okay? So what I hope, um, whenever I give this talk, I always get a little nervous, okay? I've done this across three states, and I've talked a lot about evidence-based practices, and I usually get somebody pretty upset, okay? I'm gonna say that right now in the audience, because I oftentimes, when I, when I there will be something on the list that's not under evidence-based, that's not under promising or emerging, that somebody's using, okay? And they're very emotional about it because they feel very invested in this. My job is not to tell you what to do, really, or what not to do. My job, hopefully, is to give you the information that's out there right now. Okay, what we have right now so far, it's changing all the time, okay? There are more studies that are coming out, so tomorrow when I do this, and I may be behind a little bit because I can hardly keep up with the research for all these treatments, but there may be something that's already changed from being emerging or promising to more evidence-based, okay? So I just want you to know that right now. Um, I'm gonna focus on the things that we know. It doesn't mean that what you're doing is necessarily a bad thing if you're using something that's not there. I will tell you what I, I hope you will do if you're using something that doesn't fall into that emerging practice so that you can keep track of whether or not that's working, okay? So we may have to agree right now to disagree a little bit, but I just wanna get that information out. And then it's up to you to make that decision with your family, with your team, um, school team, other therapists that you work with as to what you want, you think is the best route for your child. I also will say that parents are the best. Um, they know their child, children best. Okay, you're the best people for information. So uh, as a professional, as a therapist, I may try to guide you down a different route at times, but you know your child. And so you're probably gonna be, I'm gonna also look to you as to what, what you think is gonna um, be helpful, okay? All right, any questions or anything so far? I think we have a lot of time today. I'm gonna to start with this presentation and then I'm gonna to talk to you about one evidence-based practice that I use all the time, okay? And uh, give you some videos and show you some case studies of, of, of that practice, okay? Okay, so what does it mean? What does evidence-based mean? Um, evidence also, you can all, you also see established treatments, okay? That is also falls under evidence-based. Um, what we know is it's based on science, okay? So science meaning that there have been some fairly rigorous studies that have been done on those strategies, on those interventions, okay? They're very systematic, okay? They're objective, meaning we use designs. Um, we're not just using surveys uh, and checklists. We're actually going out and observing behaviors, and we're doing that in a, in a what we call um, a rigorous design. Usually those are single subject, okay? And this is a lot of big information you don't necessarily need to know all this, but um, most of the research on, there's more and more larger group studies that are done, because we're getting better, I think, at looking at larger numbers, but a lot of the studies that are done on individuals with autism are single subjects, so we're really looking to see their smaller numbers, we're looking to see how does that specific individual respond to an intervention, okay? And that's, we've gotten criticized, I think, in the field a little bit for not doing larger group studies, but now there are um, larger group studies that do show that there's, we have control, okay, and that we really have some, some interventions that are working well. What we know about um, evidence-based practices, that they have been reliably um, shown to show improvements, 
Okay, so reliable means that more than one person, more than one group has studied this intervention. Okay, not just the folks that developed it, and they're getting similar um, results. Okay, and similar positive results. Uh, and that the studies have been re replicated. Okay, so usually with evidence-based practices, they've been done quite a few times. All right, and again, we're getting similar results on what's happening. Um, and they're peer-reviewed, and all that means is that um, people in the field, okay, that are studying these interventions, experts have really gone over these studies, and they agree that we've used really high standards, we've used really good designs, and that the results that they're saying happened actually have occurred, okay? Um, so that's what we mean by evidence-based. It's not an easy process. Um, I've done a lot of research, single subject research, takes sometimes years to get some results. And I think that's where we're just now starting to get a lot more research because it takes a long time. And it can take years to do very large studies, and it can take 10 years to get those studies actually published. Okay? For the little studies that I've done and published with you know, two to three, maybe six individuals, um, sometimes it's taken me three years to get one study out, okay, to get it published. So it takes a while. It's rigorous. It's not easy. Um, to do, and then I'll tell you that most of the studies that I, I, I have submitted and that are peer reviewed get rejected. Okay, they didn't like something that I did, or I didn't do it well enough, or it wasn't scientific enough. Okay, so it's hard work. All right, so I always wonder if I should go through this, but I do have um, parents that really want to know if I look at studies, if I look at research, I'm not going to talk about this too much longer, okay, because I know this is not what a lot of folks are um, wanting to know that in terms of the process, but I do think it's good for you if you are reading. And if you are given an article by a pediatrician or a psychologist or maybe a teacher, um, what should you be looking for when you read these? Um, one of the things is you have to look at the claims that are made in the research. Okay? What are they saying that they've done? Okay? What are the behaviors that they have really looked at or specified? Do they talk about it increasing attention, um, decreasing um, challenging behaviors or problem behavior? Uh, in decreasing activity levels, okay? Make sure that when you're looking at those claims that they don't sound too grand. They're not using, like we, you know, we had a, um, that, they're, that they sound like they're able to cure. If you use, see any of those words of cure, okay, that's probably gonna be a red flag for you and we'll talk about that. Um, quantitative data is important, all right? That means numbers, basically. Do they give you a percentage? Do they give you a frequency? Do they give you some numbers? And it's not just based on um, anecdotal information, meaning what somebody um, observes and then just tells you that they remember, okay? So usually we're, we're, we want um, something that they've used some type of a design, okay? Um, a single subject design or a group design. You have to look at who the participants are because a lot of the interventions that are out there really started out with not kids with autism, or different age groups than maybe your child or the student that you're working with, um, or just the different behaviors, okay? So it worked really well for aggressive behavior, it worked really well for increasing spontaneous communication, but what you're really looking for is something that will help with social skills or attention. So make sure that whatever you're looking at really matches the behaviors that you're, um, that you're wanting to change for the, your child or for the, the, the person that you're working, working with. Um, how is change in behavior measured? Again, we, just, we don't want just subjective um, information. We really want to know that somebody observed, they looked at numbers, the number of times something happened, how often, a duration, something that way. All right, I'm gonna kind of move on here. Uh, I think I've talked a little bit about this. Replication, has it been done more than once? Okay, and who did the treatment? So there are, um, for instance, there are some um, interventions that are more like product-based, okay? So uh, they may have something that they're recommending that your child use, okay? If the only studies that have been done, and this has occurred, are by the people that have produced that product and are selling that product, this is problematic, okay? Because they're invested, all right? They're invested financially, and their, um, what they see can be influenced by what they want to see. Okay, so you do see studies out there that they've only been done by the folks who are, have a product that they're trying to sell, or just the folks that have developed the intervention. Okay, it doesn't have to be a product, it could be a strategy, but that's where that peer-reviewed comes in. We need to know that other people 
have done this and gotten similar results. All right? And then finally, does it apply to my, my child? And I think um, I talked a little bit about that. Okay, what are the behaviors? What are the things that you're trying to change? And does this intervention really make sense? Okay. All right, so I'm going to try to convince you that evidence-based does matter, okay? And that there, with all the things that are out there, one of the things that I think, um, the reason, I guess the most important reason that I see is that many of these kids are already behind. Okay, they're behind socially, they're behind maybe academically, typically language, right, is going to be a big thing, whether it's expressive language or receptive language. Uh, they are starting behind, so we don't have time to waste. And the older the student is, Okay, the older the person is, the more, the wider the gap often gets, okay, between what um, typically is happening with somebody at that same age, okay, developmentally, um, again, communication, social skills, academic skills. Uh, so we've got to really focus, and we only have so much time to try to get where we need to be, all right? So I think that's really, really important. Um, and we know that early in intervention, I mean, it's really, um, we have enough evidence to show that the earlier you can intervene, the more likely you're going to see um, increased success, right? Now, again, I work with the whole, all age groups. I've worked with adults, um, I've worked with children, I've worked with kids, you know, one. Uh, what I will say is I've seen improvements across the board. So don't think that if you have somebody at 15, 16, or 17, there's no room for, you, you, excuse me, room for improvement. You are probably going to be able to change quite a bit. Okay? It may take longer, all right? we might not get as far as we thought, but that doesn't mean that, that you shouldn't be working and intervening okay, at all. So I always, when I talk about early intervention, I always want to make sure that folks know that that's something that we, we try to do, but we don't always, aren't able to, able to intervene as early as we'd like. Okay? And then finally, the last one is I just think we, all children, not just children with autism, we have effective <coughs> interventions that work for many individuals, they have the right to those, okay? We can't withhold those. And so all children have the right to effective treatments. And so that's another reason why I think we have to pay attention to that evidence. Okay, um, treatment's gonna be expensive, right? If you're looking at trying to hire uh, somebody to do applied behavior analysis um, for 40 hours a week, which is um, some of where some of the research has, sh has shown there to be a lot of improvements, that's not, that's not cheap, okay? That, that costs money. Um, Weighted vests cost money. Uh, auditory integration therapy, where you, you buy the, um, the headphones and the music systems that they, they use for kids, those can cost $2,000 to be able to get those, and some of you may be able to use them. Very expensive, and even so, we have to be careful. And for some families, they might have you know, quite a bit of resources, but then there's that time thing again. How do we want to waste time on interventions that haven't been established yet and we're not sure whether or not we're going to see progress. Okay. All right. Um, some treatments can be harmful. All right. There aren't very many out there, but there are some, and some uh, that can cause emotional, can cause physical damage. Okay. Um, high doses of vitamins. All right. Can can be problematic if you have really high high doses. So most people don't get that high, but that's that's one thing that would probably could be harmful. Okay. Chelation therapies. Anybody heard of that? Okay, uh, that can be very harmful, all right? That has to do with um, uh, removing um, toxins in, in, the, in the bloodstream and in the body. And there's really no evidence to support that that um, will help individuals with autism or that they have that, okay? So that's one that's been harmful. There aren't too many out there that are harmful, but there are a few, okay? All right, so I like, to, I like David Letterman. I did when I was younger. I still kind of watch it from time to time. I can't stay up that late anymore. Um, but uh, when I was younger, I used to watch that. He always had his top ten, right, kinds of things. And so when I talk to families and they're trying to decide, um, one of the things that the terms I use is sort of the magical wand treatment. Okay. So treatments that aren't typically evidence-based, right, is what we're talking about, are not are not established, not in that promising or emerging. Okay. So one of the things. Um, is I've had folks call at the Autism Center and they'll ask me about a therapy and I haven't heard of it. I don't know what it is. Um, it's my job to know, okay? <laughs> to know what the interventions are, to know that new things are out there. So typically, if you ask a child psychologist that you're working with, your pediatrician, uh, you ask an autism consultant, um, a teacher, somebody that is a professional and has a lot of experience with autism treatment, 
and they haven't heard of it, you might have a magic wand treatment, okay? That's the first thing. Um, if there are promises for rapid change and minimal work involved, okay? We'll tell you that most of the interventions that are in the evidence-based and established are hard work, okay? It's a lot of one-on-one -on -one intensive work. It's work daily. Um, it's work for a, a long period of time before we start seeing really um, ch rapid changes. I wish that was different, um, but my experience is not, okay? And families will tell you, we've usually got families, therapists, lots of folks, teachers working with these kids, okay? So if it sounds um, like it's too good to be, too good to be true, it probably is. Okay. Um, a lot of the websites that you've been on, and maybe many of you have done this, um, have a lot of really heartfelt um, testimonials. And they'll have families and they'll have people telling their stories, but they don't have any evidence or, or research to support it. And so those are, you'll see a lot of that. And so that's something you want to kind of be um, leery of. And you want to look and see um, what, you know, is there any evidence there? Okay, so if you see something that says just one week of using the no flap mitts, okay, and your child will stop shaking and flapping their hands, okay, some that stereotypic behavior that sometimes we can see with some kids with autism, then probably there's going to be something because I don't know about that. All right, that's a hard one to change. Um, and there are things that can work for that over time, but it's probably not going to be the, the no flap mitts. All right, if it's not listed under established and emerging, and I'm going to give you, you've got an extra hand out there that has a list of, I think, I don't see that. It's back there, I gave them a bunch of them, but I made some copies of, um, from the National um, the Standards Project, which I'm gonna talk about, and there's a list of established, and she's got some here. It's just a, um, a three, uh, looks like this. I just took this, all right, and made a chart. This comes from the National Standards Report, okay, or project, so it's not something I made up. And I broke down these interventions that we're going to talk about and looked at what behaviors they tend to help, okay? So this only has those established um, practices. And so that, and then on the back of it, it describes what those are very briefly. And again, um, you have a resource, and under the resources, there's a website you can go to with all this information. There's a manual for parents um, that talks about a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today. Okay, it's free, you can, it's quite long, um, but you can get on there and you can do that, okay? So here's, there's, there really is sort of a consensus um, across some of the um, more established um, centers and, and uh, groups out there professionally, and they have all pretty much decided that mo the, the, the practices that are on here, okay, there's some variation, uh, but for the most part, these are all going to be established treatments. Okay, and so scientists and professionals in the community, so the American Academy of Pediatrics agree with this, um, the National Autism Center, right, and the National Professional Development Center on, on Autism. Okay, if you Google any of these, if you put that in there, you'll get to their websites. And some of them have video models of a lot of these interventions, so you can look and you can actually see what that looks like. So if I wanted to try discrete trial training or I wanted to use schedules, I wanted to use a self-management strategy, they will actually show um, uh, people working with individuals to implement these strategies. Okay? I'm having a hard time here. Sorry, this is getting really annoying. Am I doing okay? Is that right? Okay. lost my flip thing. Thanks. Okay. Um, so these, this is what I really tell parents to, to look at. These are the resources I think you need to pay attention to in terms of where good information come from, comes from. They are keeping up with those scientific studies and they are trying to get those out to all of you. All right? Okay. And I guess the winner in terms of if you're thinking you might have a magic wand treatment, and I always am also worried about putting this up here because I don't want to be under the impression that we don't want there to be a breakthrough or a cure for autism. Uh, at the moment, there really isn't, okay? Um, but on the positive side, some of the early intensive behavior interventions or programs for young children have, all, have actually shown that a certain percentage of their kids, uh, when they go through this for at least two years, when they go back and have a diagnostic evaluation, okay, these are young kids, usually around three, three to six years old, sometimes earlier, Two years of pretty intensive, 40 hours a week, okay, a behavioral intervention, 
Um, some of those kids, when they were retested, okay, diagnostically, did not fit the criteria of autism. Okay, so before they had this two years, they were falling under the, the autism spectrum disorder, okay, diagnostically. <laughs> now they're not. Okay, it's a small number, and it's a lot of intensive behavior. So you have to decide is that a cure or not? I'm not sure, but the symptomatology, the characteristics, um, are no, were no longer there, and that's a really great thing to know. Okay, and that was using what therapy? ABA. Um, primarily ABA. By behavior analysis. Two years. Um, the studies are two years. Uh huh. What age? Uh, so about three. well, about three to six, depending on the study. Okay, but very pretty young, and sometimes starting as young as two. <coughs> Excuse me. Any other questions? Twenty-five hours. Did it have to be forty, or could it be as low as twenty-five hours? Okay. Um, these are all really good questions, and there's some mixed, I guess, some mixed information on that. The studies, the, the couple of studies that I'm referring to had thir between 30 and 40 hours a week. Okay, the one um, that goes back to, it was done in 1987 by Ivor Lobos, uh, Lobos, sorry, and that's probably people often call e applied behavior analysis Lobos therapy. Um, his study showed that those kids had 40 hours, the kids that had 40 hours a week, all right, for, up to, for two years, 48% uh, of them no longer were diagnostically considered having autism. Okay, and that's an intensive applied behavior analysis program. And I'll talk to you about what are the characteristics of an applied behavior analysis program. Um, there, okay, other questions? Okay, but those are the only ones that I know of now. Um, there were seven, seven studies that have been done on comprehensive behavioral-based programs um, as of 2010, okay, that may have changed now. There were more long-term studies that showed that um, uh, different percentages, but that one had 48, another one had 46%, I think, of the individuals um, did not have a diagnostic uh, uh, criteria for autism anymore. Okay. I'm thinking suddenly of Jenny McCarthy's child, Evan, who doesn't mm -hmm. have autism but has that um, a, a disease that's very similar. Do you remember what it was? Nonverbal learning disorder or Asperger's? I don't, um, I don't remember exactly no, what. Klein... Kleinfelter. Okay. So but, yeah. it, but I don't think it was that either, but something... Yeah. So, no, it started with L. Lon... Lon... Mm -hmm. Lon... Lon what, what is it? Lon... Oh. It's, it's a type of seizure disorder. Yes. I don't know. Are there are anybody pediatricians that might know what that is? I don't know. Okay. Oh. Um, so you're not as... Yeah. I'm not familiar with that. No. He was behind and seems to have, so I'm wondering if the two autism and that one are very similar to each other, but you don't know, know a lot about this. I don't know. I know that she's made a lot of claims that a lot of professionals are concerned about. <laughs> okay, right, right, that. right. Um, so, she just said uh, it was you, and yeah. I don't agree with her, how she, she um, raises people. I mean, oh, the, she's on The View? Okay. Yeah. She just started, and she does a lot of that, the cleansing and all that, and I don't yeah. There's, there's a lot of um, intervention that she uses that are not, yeah. they don't even come into emerging and promising, so we don't, we, I would not recommend listening to, to her information at this point in time, but I don't know much more than that, than what some of the things that she's asked, so. Okay, um, so again, here's some of the sources. I think I've had two slides of this now, of consensus there um, regarding treatments, okay? And so I'm gonna stick to those treatments that have been um, talked about mostly with these, um, these associations and these um, national autism centers, okay? Okay, I also wanna talk, um, and I'm gonna, here's what they've done in terms of um, the, the National Autism Project, okay, Standards Project, which you have some information there. They have put these categories up for all of us to be able to kind of follow. And some, um, Dr. Lindgren is a psychologist at the University of Iowa. He's the co-director of the Autism Center. And so on that left side, he's done a lot of research and a lot of study, um, done, uh, was asked to do a um, analysis of the research and the evidence-based practices for the Department of Human Services in Iowa. And he has a little bit different kind of categories, but they're basically the same. You know, so you'll see some back and forth, depending on where you look, you'll see established, you'll see significant scientific evidence is one category. Okay, that's what I'm going to be talking about mostly today. You'll see the next step is promising or emerging. Okay, so you'll see a lot of interventions that fall under those. 
And then the third one is limited scientific evidence and unestablished. Those are the ones I'm not going to talk about much. They are, I will, I've listed some, so that at least you know what they are, okay, but I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. And then there's some that are not recommended or ineffective and harmful. Okay, so these people have categorized all of these interventions that we see out there, and that, I think it's really helpful for all of us, because we can look at those and we can try to make some decisions based on where those interventions fall under, okay? All right, so here's what's been, um, I guess, identified as established. And you have some definitions. For the sake of time, I, I can't, I'm gonna give you some kind of brief ideas about what are some things that fall under this because there's antecedent package, I mean, package. There's a lot of different strategies that fall under that. Behavioral package, there's a lot of different strategies that fall under that. Um, and then there's that comprehensive behavioral treatment for young children, okay, that's like the early intervention behavior, the studies that I was just talking about um, that can be 40 hours a week, sometimes they're less. Uh, uh, all these things here are things that if you are asking, if you hear your teachers or your professionals or therapists talking about, um, these are things that we would recommend. Okay, And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about, giving you a little bit of description of what these are, but it's hard because there's a lot, and I could do, I've done, you know, workshops, two-day workshops on the first one. Okay, antecedent package about what that went involved, what that involves, and what kinds of things you could use. So I'm again just trying to give you some information, some wording, um, and I did some small definitions on that sheet for you, so you can start kind of at least having a little bit of an idea. But I think these are things that you want to be asking for. Okay, asking about, asking your teachers if they're using some of these. Okay. Um, or if you hear this terminology, then at least you know that falls in a category that we've gotten some really good research to show that these have shown some pretty good effects for kids. Okay? All right, so antecedent package. That really falls those first, well, pretty much almost all of these, except for the story-based intervention, the end, um, which still uses some, almost all of these interventions use applied behavior analysis strategies. Okay, so somebody in here in the audience has already mentioned that. You'll hear ABA, okay? I'm going to, after we talk about what these are a little bit, I'm going to talk to you about ABA and what that looks like and what's involved, okay? So the positive thing is that if you are trying to put, have more bang for your buck, okay, you really want to look at interventions that use some of these applied behavior analysis strategies, okay? So that first one, antecedent package, what that typically involves is trying to arrange the environment, okay? setting it up differently um, so that you are preventing uh, problematic behaviors, okay, things like aggressive behavior, self-injurious behavior, destructive behavior, sometimes um, ritualistic, obsessive kind of compulsive behaviors, and also setting the environment up so that you're teaching and you're seeing more appropriate behaviors occur, like functional communication, making choices, following directions, um, I'm trying to think of other things, good social skills, all right? And how we do that is we may provide choices, okay, and teach individuals how to make choices. We may prompt in a certain way, so we may provide cues, all right, we may verbally, there's some really systematic ways to teach individuals how to do things across their day, daily living skills, okay, so prompting strategies. Um, what else? It can involve using pictures, okay, using visual cues, using schedules. It's a lot of different things, but what we're doing with that is we're setting up an environment where we're more likely to see the behaviors we want to see, and we're less likely to see the behaviors we're trying to decrease that are maybe more problematic. Is that making sense? Okay. So if you have a child that is in a behavioral program, okay, or in a um, school environment, they might and probably are, almost all teachers are using some type of antecedent, uh, antecedent, um, or antecedent package. Okay, um, so that's one thing. And again, there's a really big description in the National Standards Report that you can get on, that you have part of, okay? Any questions about that? It's hard, I don't, and there's not a whole lot of um, videos out there to show you this. Okay, there are some, choice making and things. Behavioral package is gonna involve um, some of those same things, but we're looking at um, one treatment that I'm gonna show you, show you how it's done, um, the second part of today. It's called functional communication training, okay? And this is really um, a way to teach individuals how to communicate more functionally and how to decrease challenging behaviors that they're using, 
right? And that's a big thing that we see with kids with autism, right? And, and adults, um, challenge behaviors. I probably get that more than anything when somebody asks me about a service or a behavior that they're um, needing to work with. 90% of the calls that I get are either language-based or um, problem behavior. How can we decrease some of these challenging behaviors that my child's doing? And how can we increase their communication and language skills? Okay. The behavioral package looks a lot at consequences. So what do we do after a child does something? Okay, so if they are aggressive, how do we respond to that? And what we know behaviorally is that if um, we look at what the motivators are and what, what, what that, the purpose of the behavior is, okay, what the function is, and we respond in a way that um, will decrease that motivation, all right, and I'll give you an example, that we're more or less likely to see that behavior. So a lot of the kids that I work with um, through assessment, we find out, and especially in schools, what are they want, not wanting to do? Work. Academic work, okay? You know, come to the table, sit, follow an adult direction, no matter how little they are or how old they are, it often involves that. I really don't want to be doing this right now. So we see a lot of disruptive behaviors during those times. So when the teacher says, okay, time to get out your math book, or let's come sit down and do our, our, um, our work today, we'll see an escalation of problem behavior. Okay, what typically happens when that occurs? Anybody? What do you do when somebody escalates a behavior that's really scary, or that's aggressive, or if they throw something? What do you try to do as a parent? What's that? Restrain. Yeah, you might restrain, or what do you, what else did I hear? Redirect? Is that somebody said? Distract. Distract. Um, what else? Put on my mean face, mean voice, and say, go to your room, you're having a <laughs> okay, use timeout, but I heard timeout, okay? So timeout is the most widely used behavioral intervention that is used counter-therapeutically, okay? Because oftentimes what kids want is they don't want to have to do that work. So they are excited when you pull them out, you take the work away, you take them away from the group they don't want to be in, you take them outside to sit, and the work stays in the classroom, okay? So that's an example, right? Um, so what we will do in that, in a behavioral package, is that we're going to try to do the opposite. <coughs> so if we think it's the behavior functions to avoid or escape something, we're going to set up the environment so they're more likely to maybe do the task. Okay, so we do a lot of different things. Do we need to break it down? Do we need to provide choices? Do we need to use some type of modeling? Do we need to highlight something? There's all kinds of things you can do. Then if the behavior still occurs, we're going to give them an appropriate way maybe to say, I don't, I need a break from this, I don't want to do this right now, I'll do it later. But we're going to try to, we're not going to take the work away when they escalate the behavior. The work's going to stay there, okay? And you're going to have to maybe do something different. You're going to have to do a little bit of it before it goes away, or you're going to have to tell me in an appropriate way, not hitting the kid next to you, not dumping over your chair, not ripping the paper up, okay? So what we're doing is we manipulate how we respond to the behavior based on what we think the motivation to engage in that behavior is. So that's one way, but that's, that, that does give you an idea of things that go on a behavior package, okay? We use things like, um, uh, so, it's hard to make. we use things like um, reinforcement, okay? So token boards, all right? So we're gonna reinforce thing, behaviors that we wanna see, and we're no longer gonna reinforce other behaviors. So token economies are big. Um, we use something called extinction. And that's what I was just telling you about. We're not going to reward those inappropriate behaviors anymore. Right? If we think you're trying to get teacher attention or parent attention, we're going to do what? We're going to ignore you when you're engaging in those behaviors. But as soon as you are behaving appropriately, we're going to attend to you. Okay? It's hard for me because these are large, broad things. Um, but those are some of the words. Task analyses are used in behavior packages. Okay? One thing that's really hard for individuals with autism and other developmental disabilities at times is when you tell them they have to go wash their hands or get ready for school. Okay? There's about, there could be a hundred steps in that chain of behaviors. Okay? You've got to get dressed, you've got to wash your face, you have to find the towel, you have to find the soap, you have to turn on the water, brush your teeth, uh, get your backpack. I mean, it can go on and on and on. That's a lot of little behaviors. And so what we will do is in a behavioral package office, we'll break those down into very small steps, and we will help you, and we'll, we'll intervene on those steps. So we might use schedules, we might use pictures, 
but we're going to break that down into smaller behaviors. We're going to prompt, we're going to cue, we're going to give you assistance, we're going to reinforce as things as you do the responses that we want. Okay? So some of it involves what we call task analysis, breaking larger complex behaviors down into smaller parts. This is just a few of the things. So you can see where the difficulty arrives when we're talking about um, certain interventions. Okay? But if you see some of these words, reinforcement, you see shaping behaviors, okay? you see what we call chaining, those things are involved in that. Okay? And there are descriptions in the handouts. And you'll see a little bit when I show you the, um, the case study and the videos of, of some kids that I work with, some of these things being used. Right? Joint attention, I'm going to skip over the comprehensive because I'm going to talk about it in a little bit. Joint attention is really teaching kids. Joint attention means kids can, a child can look at an activity, play with an activity, look at somebody else who's interacting with that same activity, comment on it, um, and, and kind of jointly play with and attend to an item. Okay? There, is, there are interventions that work just on this. And one of the things that we know is that this is a huge area that many of these kids, especially young kids, are missing. And we call this a pivotal area, okay? Because if you intervene with this behavior and you can teach kids to do this, to share, to interact, to talk about, to look at the same object or activity in a play situation, we know that lots of other behaviors start increasing, all right, that we haven't even worked on. So social skills, other language and communication skills. So this is probably one of the skills that most comprehensive behavioral programs will be working on. Okay? Yeah. Um, our school uses a timeout, like, or is that a big part of the behavioral package? Yes, when, but when it's based on function, okay? So timeout is a very effective strategy if time in is more reinforcing than time out, okay? So again, if the function, if the child wants to get out of a specific activity or with a person, I've taught kids, there are certain people they don't want to be around. <coughs> and they, we've taught them how to say, basically, no thank you, or please move away from me, or those kinds of things. Um, so sometimes it's people. Sometimes it's activities, sometimes it's tasks, sometimes it's um, just a whole setting that they don't want to be in. So as long as they're not trying to avoid that, if, if, then it can be effective. So timeout is very good for attention-maintained behaviors. Okay, so the, if uh, individuals are engaging in a behavior to get your attention. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, all right. Other questions? Okay, so there's lots of different things on here. Schedules, that's using pictures. And visual cues, photographs, okay? You're breaking sometimes activities a day sometimes. Most people know what schedules are. I, I, can I show you the hands for that? Your child using a visual schedule, a picture schedule, an activity schedule, these work really well. Um, they tend to help, help individuals predict what's coming next. They break a larger activity down, but it's all about predictability, okay? And they're very, very, very effective. Um, and the last one is um, basically social stories. You heard of those? Yes, no? Anybody not heard of the social story? Okay, it's a description of usually an activity um, that's going to happen, and we talk about the behaviors that we want to see. There can be pictures with it, but there's usually a system of statements that you use within this, um, but it describes what you want to see an individual do when they go to the supermarket, when they go to the movies, when they're in, um, uh, in a certain classroom, okay? And there's been a lot of evidence to support that we see more of those behaviors as proactive, pro-social behaviors when a story is talked about prior to going to that event. Okay? This one has just kind of moved up and established. For years and years and years it was used um, all over schools. Okay? I use them, but we didn't have a lot of good research to back it up. But this one now has fa fallen into the established treatments, which is great because the people that were using this have done some really good studies with it. Okay. Um, we're going to take a break here in just a few minutes. All right? so. Bear with me. Um, applied behavior analysis, that's what's been coming up over and over, so I'm going to spend a little time on that. Uh, this is really where you get the most bang for your buck. And I, I have a hard time, this is what I do, so I sort of have a bias, I suppose, or maybe you can call it lucky that I decided to go into this area, because I didn't know this when I started. I just thought, this looks like it works really well, and I kind of get this, um, and it makes sense, and um, there are lots of lots of studies there's growing scientific consensus, I think, across the board that if you're using strategies based on the principles of applied behavior analysis, based on some of the things I've just been talking about, 
um, using reinforcement, using tokens, using uh, prompting systems, looking at the function of behavior, okay, and using timeout effectively in that as one strategy, that you can see pretty significant progress with kids. And again, there's a variety of, the biggest thing is how many hours, and somebody's already asked that. Um, what generally they were saying is that you need to have a minimum of 25, 25 hours a week, okay? That doesn't mean 25 hours of one-to-one, -one, which is the big misconception, where it's an adult and a child in an intensive, okay? What it means is that they're you're using at least, it may be some small groups, it's going to be probably some one-on-one, -on -one, but it varies. But what we know is that if they're using some of these principles across the day for at least 25 hours, we're more likely to see progress. I will tell you, the more is better if it's good ABA, you know, if people are using really good um, if they're really using these strategies, okay, so somebody asks about 40 hours a week. It's pretty, it's very, there's very substantial research to back that 40 hours a week is going to be pretty good um, for those kids, but the reality is that that's really expensive and it's difficult to get. And I've, I've seen kids make progress in 15 hours a week. Okay, good progress. I see some kids make really good progress with 10, 10 hours a week. So it is individually based, and so um, one child may need 40, the next child may do better and do okay and make the same amount of progress with 15 hours a week. Okay, I wish I had more for you, but I would stick to kind of that 25 as being sort of a minimum, right? Now that doesn't have to be in one setting. That can be in home, in the school, in the community. And I know across Iowa, I work... Um, working with the state a little bit, and uh, have been doing workshops for a school-based ABA program. It's called Strategies for Teaching Based on Autism Research. It's called STAR, it's developed out of Oregon. It's a behavioral program. It has a lot of these, all of the strategies that we use are in the established and evidence-based, but we're teaching teachers and paraeducators to do this in the schools. So our whole thing is if you, they're already there seven hours a week. I mean, seven hours a day, you know, five to seven, depending on how young they are. If we can get this happening in the schools, then parents don't have to try to hire somebody to do it after school or during um, weekends or whatnot. Okay? So I think when you think about 25 five hours a week, we really are going to be pro it's probably going to be across multiple places. Not all the time, but maybe some home as well. Okay? I'm wondering, has there been any studies as to how progress drops off as a child ages? That's a good question. Um, we, have, we know that between the ages of three and nine is where the most research is for applied behavior analysis. Okay. However, there's lots of studies for adults, depending on the strategies that are used. So that we know. I don't know in terms of drop-off. Um, I know that there's a, um, an intervention that's in a behavioral intervention called Pivotal Response Treatment, and it's working on communication skills, language, play skills, social skills. Um, that is an ABA strategy, and some of the folks that have developed that and been studying it for over 20 years, um, they found that after the age of, let me think if I get this right, after the age of eight, I believe, that they had um, a very low rate of getting language, verbal language, okay? So that every for every year after three that um, they did not develop language, verbal language, okay? The chances of them in ever establishing really sentences and verbal vocabulary decreased significantly. And I, I don't have those figures in my head um, at this point, but it was, it was, it was, we knew that after a certain age with that intervention, they didn't see a whole lot of progress. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Um, so ABA, we're going to talk a little bit, and then we're going to take a break. I want to do a couple more slides, and then we'll take a like a ten minute break and let people get up and stretch a little bit. Okay. So one um, one of the common misconceptions of ABA, and I like to I like to educate folks on this, is that it's one treatment. Okay. And so families and parents will often call and ask me. Um, how do I get ABA? I want ABA treatment. Well, like I was trying to explain to you under the behavioral package, and if you go and get online, you read some of that, and the antecedent package, it's a lot of different strategies. But it's a methodology, so it has to do with reinforcing behaviors we want to see, breaking behaviors down, providing consequences that are based on function. Um, it's also not just discrete trial training, and people heard of that. 
Uh, not many people here, a couple? Okay. Um, that is breaking behaviors down into very small parts. So we might be working, looking at, working on looking at me, making eye contact. We might be working on clapping. We might be working on uh, tracing numbers. But we're going to really reinforce small little behaviors like that very rapidly. And we're also going to correct errors as we see them. And so it's a kind of a fast, rapid, one-to-one -one methodology. And a lot of folks, because of that early study with Iger Lobos in 1987, that was one where he had 40 hours a week where he did a lot of discrete trial training okay, of behaviors that they wanted to see, that they saw um, quite a bit of improvement. Okay, so some people will call it that. Um, but that's only one intervention in applied behavior analysis. Okay. Um, it's only used for children with autism spectrum disorder. Majority of research has been, a lot of the research has been done on autism. And this is an intervention that has more research than others for kids with autism and adults. But um, I use it, it's been used effectively for all kinds of other disabilities, okay, and in, in, in individuals without disabilities. So the methodology is used across all kinds of things. In industry, um, there's all kinds of other areas that aren't even related to disabilities that we use some of these methods. Um, and then that 40 hours a week. It doesn't have to be done that long to see improvements. Um, I work with a lot of families and a lot of kids that might get 10 hours a week and we're doing really good. Okay. All right, let's stop there. It's hot. Is anybody else hot? <laughs> I'm hot. We'll take, um, it's 2.05, so how about we come back at maybe 2.15 and we'll, we'll pick up. Okay. We have little cupcakes and water out there. So It was getting hotter by the moment. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I'm getting to that age, so sometimes you don't know. But if it's really hot, or it's just internal with me only. So as my husband points out more and more. Um, so I, I really have a hard time with this talk. I'm just going to let people know this. I've done this a lot of different places for a lot of different audiences, and here's where I kind of feel like um, it's, it's self-defeating. And I'm not very good with internet, so there's a, I'm going to give you a resource because I don't have a lot of this where I can hands-on show you because there's so much to be able to show you under evidence-based practices. And maybe uh, I talked to uh, uh, Christina a little bit, um, mostly about maybe coming back and focusing more on a couple of these that are evidence-based, showing you videos and, and a little more interactive at some point. But today, I just hope you know this is really guided at trying to give you some information to get you started to know where to go and to understand some of the terminology and some of the strategies that are out there that if you hear them, you at least know how to look up them, you've got some definitions of what they are, but I just can't go over everything. The other thing I struggle with, um, being back here in Iowa, I've been in West Virginia, Oregon, Kentucky, uh, Colorado, and now I'm back to my roots, which is where I started. And I have to say that one of the things that we recommend so much, and people ask me, and I have to give the evidence is that applied behavior analysis is really, again, that we have the most research to back these things up. But the downside is, at three years ago when I moved back, I was one of 30 behavior analysts, board certified behavior analysts in the state. Uh, that's increasing a little bit, but what I'm getting at is it's really hard to find these services and to get people to do it. And I just feel, when I talk to parents all the time, I hate sometimes almost bringing this up because then it's like, well, where do I find these services and who can I have do them? And I don't always have answers for you on that. Um, in the out west and other places, there have you know they do have more ABA services. They've been doing it a little bit longer. I will tell you there are places that are doing it in parts of the state. Um, the University of Iowa has just got a program um, in their school psychology department that is certifies behavior analysts, so it's focusing on a lot of these strategies that I've been talking about. So hopefully those people will stay and not move. That's progress. And then like I said, the state, um, I worked with the Autism Center and a colleague of mine in Oregon to, we wrote a, a statewide grant to try to train teachers. It wasn't accepted initially. 
Um, we're they're gonna take a look at it again in October, but this is something that I did for a year in Iowa City, and we've done it in Oregon, and it's going in lots of different states and internationally to train teachers and educators to use these procedures. So I'm hoping that the state will eventually um, help us get this out so that we can get out to places all across the state and train teachers. Yeah. I'm thinking of a case that um, was even prior to idea 2004, I think, of the parent that went ahead and took the training themselves and then taught their child themselves and then was reimbursed by the school. That's happened? Uh-huh, it, it has. Um, so, unfortunately, um, in a lot of cases, and, and there are a lot of parents, and that's what they, you know, they end up either hiring out or they go, they go legally. Um, and so states are starting, including um, districts in Iowa. A lot of the districts are starting to train, sending their um, folks to these trainings. And unfortunately, it was based on litigation, okay, because parents were saying, look, we know what works now, and we want our kids to have this, and it's an instructional strategy. It's, it's, it's good teaching. We know, we know that works, but the schools are also, and I have to wear both my hats because I also work for school districts and I understand the resources involved and I realize that it can't happen overnight and there's always funding and then we get into a, it's a federal issue, it, it can get really ugly really quickly about money and, and who's going to do it. But what I say about that is that training, we just have to educate and get more people out there and if we can get parents trained, we can get teachers trained. To some degree, we can get, um, we have some professionals, some therapists out there that we, we're building the opportunities and the places and the settings that this can happen in. How okay. many years of training? How many years program is this? Uh, the program is, is the certification program. There are only um, five classes actually that you have to take. So you can do it in um, the, the coursework in a year. They have many more um, classes that you take, if I remember correctly. Um, and, but then you have to have it's 1,500 hours of supervision out in the field working with kids instructing this uh, to be able to, um, to get, be board certified. You have to have a bachelor's degree minimum, a master's degree to be a BCBA. So a master's degree can be in education, it can be in psychology, it can be in social work, it can be in speech and language pathology. And then you have this behavioral coursework that you take in addition and then you have this 15 hours of training that's supervised, and it can be in multiple settings. It can be in clinical settings, home, or schools. Okay? Does that help? Is that okay. all this or a different kind of um, It's a lot of different things. So it's basic behavior principles. It's going to be some of the things that I show you. Um, so it's, it's uh, treatment. It's assessment, functional behavioral assessments, how to assess behaviors. Um, and doing that, uh, it involves then a lot of the treatment strategies that we're talking about. So discrete trial can be part of that. Um, other types of communication-based behavioral treatments. So it isn't yeah. like specific to the program? No, 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 no. And that's not, there's not really, you have to go to him for that. This, that again is, discrete trial training is one intervention that's part of a behavioral training program. Yeah. And so, for instance, the, the STAR curriculum that uh, I've been using in schools is heavily based on discrete trial training. If you want more information, Christine is actually um, doing this with her own children. She's been to a couple of the STAR workshops uh, that we've done, and uh, it uses that. It uses what's called the pivotal response treatment, but it, which is more of a, a treatment in play situations, in natural settings. It's more child-led, more play-based. Okay, and then it uses things like task analyses and routines across the day. So it's a combination, and I, I like that program because one of the drawbacks, I think, or one of the criticisms of discrete trial, which is a very intensive back and forth, adult-led, therapist-led program, okay, uh, is that kids learn how to respond really well with that one adult in that one situation in that one setting, but they can't generalize the skills to other times of the day when they're out there in the real world, okay? When they're um, at the grocery store, when they're going through the halls in the classroom or the school, uh, when they're out in the community. So, and that is a, a, that is a good criticism. In the past, that generalization piece has been hard to, to bring in. So when you use other things like pivotal response treatment, then you're taking those skills that you teach and you are implementing them across the day. And that generalization piece should be a part of every behavioral program, where you're teaching the skills in more isolated situations, where you have a little bit more control, but then you're also prompting those and you're teaching those throughout that child's day, 
throughout the routines that they normally do. And so that's really important. So if you're asking about programs, behavioral programs, say, what are you doing about generalization? How do you teach my child about generalization? Make sure you bring that up. What are you doing outside of the one-to-one -one when you're working with my child at the table? Okay? And they should be able to answer that, and they should be able to give you some data to show you that. So I'll kind of move on a little bit, and I'll get to some of the, the components I've talked about. So if you're looking for an ABA program, all right, for your child, okay, and again, let's, let's be positive here and hope that we're working towards getting those across the state, and at least if you're going to your teachers or you're going to a therapist, I've had people come up to me, I'm, I'm going to move, and what can I look for when I go to another state, okay? So these are some of the things that are really important. So very systematic and direct instruction. So that is, some of that is that discrete trial, okay? You're breaking behaviors down into these trials, one thing at a time, and you're reinforcing and rewarding that behavior, okay? Look at me, give me five, match this letter, give me red, okay? Um, can be lots of different things, all right? And then we're gonna reward that behavior very quickly. If you don't do it correctly, we're gonna help you. We're gonna correct something called errorless learning that's used in discrete trial, okay? We know that individuals with autism, especially young kids, make, if they make, are allowed to continue to make the same error over and over, go this way when you say go this way, look up here when you say look at me, that that becomes a pattern of their responding. It becomes a chain of behaviors that they think is part of what we do, okay? And so we have to step in and we, we have to we know this through research. We cannot allow them to continue to make those errors. So we step in, we help them to do the right thing, walk this way, okay? Look up here, that kind of thing. And, and when they do that, then they get rewarded for that, okay? So we sort of break, break them from those habits that are incorrect responses, errorless learning, something that you want to maybe write down and ask if you're looking for um, programming, okay? Individualized supports and services, that just, again, gets to be some one-on-one some -on -one is probably going to be pretty effective. Small groups are very effective. Um, that's going to be a big component of ABA. Um, data collection, all right? I'm, uh, I guess my students call me a data nerd, all right? Very data. I want to see the data. And I'll give you a little example of something that happened just this last week. Um, you should, whatever program your child's in, whether it's school-based, whether it's outside services, um, wherever they're at, the professionals should be able to show you that your child's making progress, okay? Visually, whether it's through graphs, which I really like, okay? Um, or percentage of the time when we started the program that they were using verbal language, okay? And now, two months later, what percentage are they doing that? Has it increased? If it stayed the same, then what are we doing as a team? What are the professionals doing to change that. Okay, so data, behavioral programs, and I think that's why we've got a lot of the research. We've got the evidence is because we do take data on individual behaviors. That one behavior, we might be taking data on saying hello <coughs> when somebody, you see somebody who walks into a room and looks at you. Initiating a verbal response. We will take data on that thing. Okay? We will take data on following that one step direction. We will be able to show you um, if when I say, give me the yellow card, give me the yellow bear, or the yellow cup, that you can do that accurately nine times out of ten, five days in a row. Okay, that's how specific I'm talking about. And that's why good behavioral programs monitor very frequently, daily, weekly, hourly, okay, the behavior. So it's intense in that way because people need to be trained to take the data, to collect it, to graph it, and show parents. Uh -huh. right? that um, by doing that, suddenly other good stuff seems to come along right with it. Sure, sure. So one of the things that we teach in pivotal response training is that joint attention, okay? So when we're playing with an item, um, a toy, whatever it is, and it doesn't have to be a toy if you've got an older, um, it tends to be more with younger kids, but I've seen it uh, done with um, school-age kids and even older, um, where we're doing some activity. It might be with an iPad, okay? We're doing a, a game back and forth that they're able to play that game, look at it, look at you, make a comment, and do something else, okay? We're jointly attending to the same activity, and I'm not just playing over here with my stuff or right next to you, or maybe we've got the same activity, but I'm not doing anything with you that's interactive, okay? And that's what our kids with autism tend to do. 
So other skills that we see oftentimes that when we're doing this PRT, when we're practicing this, are things like following directions. So when I ask somebody, I'll say, hey, um, move the car, or let's watch the car go, and they start imitating and following that. We see more eye gaze oftentimes. Um, we'll just increase language, okay? Choice making oftentimes. And we build that into the program, all right? But we see those <coughs> behaviors aren't necessarily being targeted for intervention, but we see more and more of those things happening, okay? that help? Okay, right. and that's why they're pivotal skills. Not putting yeah. all that effort into um, measuring it and it's still occurring. Yeah, and you, then you can measure it. And a lot of times what they've done, that's how we know that these pivotal sk skills occur and we can claim, we can say this happens, is because we started noticing this, and when I say we, I think the people that are researching that, not me specifically, um, they started documenting these things. And they said, we're not really intervening here, but look, my child's looking at me more. My child has more functional skills. They're playing with the car the right way. They're feeding the baby. They're stacking the blocks. They're building the Legos thing. They're commenting now on what's happening. And it's something that's a functional and that's um, concept. It's related to the activity that we're doing, okay? The ball's going up, or we see more... Wow, you know, because you model this, right? We model these things when we're playing with kids a lot. And we'll say, look, it's going down, you know? Or look out, and then you start seeing them doing those contextual kinds of things, but we weren't really, you know, specifically thinking that they might start doing that, okay? So pivotal skills, pivotal response treatment has a lot of efficacy. And I find that parents and families like it a lot more than discrete trial because it's naturally... Um, in a play-based situation where you're sitting with your child and you've got preferred toys and activities, you're following their lead. So if they reach for this cool squishy toy or whatever it is, okay, then you're going to follow their lead and we're going to talk about that or do something with that. It's not me picking the activity. They get to do it. Okay, so it seems to be more, a little bit more less adult-directed and sometimes we see less problem behaviors with that intervention initially than we do with something like discrete trial. Okay. Airless learning, does that always involve use of pivotal skills? Um, airless learning, we think we might do that in PRT where we correct errors. Um, we do do some of that, we'll kind of model, but airless learning is more tied to discrete trial training than uh, we see. So. Okay, um, what else can I see here? Um, oftentimes a low teacher to student ratio, not all the time. Okay, I just want you to know that. Um, parent training component is we know that some of the best programs out there like the um, Early Start Denver model, okay, that's an early childhood um, based uh, behavioral program. Um, that's one, LEAP is another, it's a national program, that's not around here, but they have a, a heavy parent training component and some of these really intensive behavioral programs will um, only take children if their families can work and learn the program as well, okay. And the reason is, is we know that if that's happening at home and school and in the therapy, the kids are going to do better over time, okay? And that last one is a functional approach to problem behavior. Now, I'm going to really talk about that in the second half when I show you the functional communication training. Is It's, again, looking at when is time out effective and when is it not effective. When is ignoring a child effective? When is it not, okay? We look at, we assess um, the behaviors of your child. Usually it's challenging behaviors. Okay, and we're able to determine what motivates them. Okay, is it 90% of the time we see a child having a tantrum when he's asked to follow an adult direction? We see that a lot. So, and if we do, then we would say those are escape or avoidance behaviors. And so we're going to have to do the opposite. We're going to have to do something different. Okay, so a functional approach has to do with what motivates a child to learn and what motivates them to engage in both inappropriate and appropriate behaviors. Okay. Functional behavioral assessments, have you guys heard of those in your schools? Okay, huge now. Um, it's mandated through IDEA in, this, in, the, um, in the federal league. So if you have a child in the school that's engaging in problem behaviors, there has to be some type of functional behavioral assessment done at some point. If, there's, if the team decides, you know, if you decide it's severe enough that you need to be working on it, okay? Um, we just really push that because it's very effective in developing treatments that match that behavioral function. Okay. Am I going too fast or are we doing okay? Functional behavioral assessment. Mm -hmm. How does a person know whether they're being properly involved as a parent within that process? It seems like the schools often take over and do it on their own without parental input. That's been my experience. 
Well, and I'm just going to talk about the school district that I'm in right now because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. But we have to get a signature from a parent. We have a, a, a form that says um, when we're going to do a functional behavioral assessment, and it needs to be signed. I don't know what what the what goes on here, um, and I think that's pretty good practice. So if you're going to intervene or you're going to be looking at the function of behavior, usually we have to get a parent signature. So we have a meeting or we have something that we just talk to them about why and what the behaviors are that we're concerned with. So you might. So I don't know how to answer that question. Maybe. Um, when we I can talk about that a little bit after the, the break. Would that be, I mean, after we... Well, one part that, like, when it comes to the parts about whether um, there's something, whether that there's something to be learned, whether the child needs to learn something versus they're just trying to get attention. Mm -hmm. I think that section, if you don't involve the parent, then it can just be said, well, the child doesn't need to learn anything. And, and that's what we ran to at the meeting is, well, wait a minute, I think he needs to learn stuff. So then basically they would have had to redo the... So it's a skill deficit, is what yes. you're saying. Yeah, yeah, and you see that a lot. But yeah. of course they didn't redo yeah. it. They just said, oh, yeah, I guess that's true. And nothing's happened since. <laughs> well, I will say that most of the time when I work with, um, in the schools, and when I do functional behavioral assessments, I would say, oh gosh, I don't know if I can give a percentage, but a large percentage of the time, there is, a, there is both a skill and a motivational deficit. Okay, so they're not, we're not motivated to do this. We've got to figure out what we can do to get you motivated to do these things. But there's also a skill deficit. The work is too difficult or it's not presented in a way that I can understand it. There's too much verbal and enough visual. Um, we haven't broken it down into smaller steps, so I'm getting very confused because there's 10 steps to this activity I need to do and I forgot after the first step. So how can we make that more clear? So almost always one of the first steps I do as a behavior analyst is I come in and look at the curriculum I look at how the tasks are set up, um, what they're doing. I look at their um, reports, and I look at where their um, cognitive functioning is, what are, where do they test out in certain areas, if that's the case. And then I look at the, what we're doing. And is there something that we could be doing? And a lot of times I find that the work is at a frustration level for kids, meaning it's too difficult. They don't have the prerequisite skills that they need to be able to complete this task. Okay, so. A lot of, it's just a lot of involvement. Sometimes I come in and that's not true. They have done a great job. This kid, it's not about they can't do it. We have gone back and it's, we've seen it happen before. It says the child's choosing is not motivated and it's more behavioral. So then we got to think about how we motivate this child to do this. How can we make it worth their while and their, their things you can do? If we know the instructional level is where it should be, we set the task up to be as least diverse as possible, okay? And we are gonna reward this child for doing this and it's with something that they really is preferred. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I can't stick to that. I can't talk more about that right now, but I'll be happy to talk to you with that. Do you guys mark off both boxes then? When both are going on? Or do you find yourselves, yeah. oh, okay, because yes. our school didn't know whether they could do that. Thank you. I, I don't know if it's so correct, four, <laughs> but I'm not, I just say that we have, I have done that. I'm not saying that it's the right way. Um, to do it, but um, talk to you know talk to the people in the schools um, about you know every district has some different things um, that they do, and make sure that you're kind of at least following what you think is supposed to be happening. <laughs> All right, okay. Here's you're gonna see a lot of overlap. So here's just this for young children effective program. So you're gonna see a lot of overlap in that slide be that I had before, um, or is this the same one? Hold on, did I move this? Yeah. Okay. So family component. Um, you see that intensive 24 hours a week. Um, these are things that we find in, in really successful programs where kids tend to do better behaviorally. Um, and these are again for younger kids. Um, high structure routines, um, that generalization piece at the bottom. Okay? So those are things you want to try to look for, ask about. Um, oh, and opportunities to interact with other peers. Okay, Pe peers that don't have autism or don't have a disability. Um, that's really, it can be really effective and important. A lot of these programs bring in social skills training and just have other kids available to that they that they are around okay and good modeling right that's what we want <laughs> we want our, we want that modeling of um, what, it, what typically would occur at that age okay so getting back to um, that we talked about a little bit of the scientific I've given you a list right I'm saying say I've talked fully about those you've got some definitions about some of those science scientific and evidence-based practices um, established practices. Here's the next step down, okay? And this is promising or emerging, all right? Now, I will say that some people have put um, some 
big, uh, these big national companies that have done a lot of research on that list. Sometimes some of these were put in the, the significant. Okay, so there's a little bit back and forth with some of these. And so there's some disagreement based on how they, they looked at the studies. Okay, so what I will say is we always try to recommend parents try to start with those established, have some established treatments that you're using, um, but you may be using some of these. Okay, it's not necessarily where we'd start, but they may be things that you're already doing. So odd con, I actually think that's more of an established treatment, to be honest. Um, not just kids with autism, but augmentative and alternative communication devices, Dynavoxes, um, uh, iPads, we're starting to get some more research on that, but we don't have a ton. But electronic devices that help kids communicate or um, are able to socialize can be really effective. All right, how many families, is anybody using Oddcon here? Um, okay, yeah. But one thing I do see with Oddcon a little bit is oftentimes it starts out to be too many choices and too much for a student to do. Um, that's the only difficulty I see is there's maybe too many options and that child doesn't, can't even make choices between two at that point. They don't know how to follow the, to scan or they don't know how to, to, to do the buttons. There's too many choices available. So sometimes that's problematic. But if you work with your speech people and they're, they're, they're oftentimes very helpful with helping you choose an odd comm device. Uh, cognitive behavior therapy, that's used a lot with older kids, okay, kids with Asperger's. And that's teaching, um, teaching individuals, adults, um, elementary age and older, uh, really have, typically these aren't kids that have intellectual disabilities, okay, because we're teaching, uh, I see a lot with Asperger's, how to um, replace negative thoughts with more positive thoughts, okay, so if I start going down, so for anxiety, um, a lot of individuals with Asperger's have a lot of anxiety about certain social situations, and so what we do in this therapy is that we, we teach them when they start to go down and say, I'm nervous, I don't like this, there's all these people, what if I do this? To take those processes and start saying something more positive, things that they can do and practice it. And that's been a very effective treatment for, that, um, for those, those kinds of kids. Okay. And adults have used this quite, um, and not just kids with autism, lots of other disabilities. So that one um, can be very effective. Music therapy. I actually don't know a lot about this. Um, that's one of those new ones that is just starting to get some research out there. Um, and uh, they, they target things like social skills and language um, and interaction okay, with music therapy. Um, picture exchange communication system, PECs, a lot of people. So using pictures or symbols, um, you give that symbol or that picture to communicate. Okay, and you'll see I want strips. Um, they oftentimes start with, uh, and they're building sentences. Um, it's a way to communicate, okay? Uh, what else do we have? Um, teach, anybody heard of Project Teach in North Carolina? Probably most of, that's what we do really well in Iowa, I think. That's setting up the environment using um, work systems, using visual cues, using pictures, um, making things very predictable in terms of routines and schedules, okay? And again, if you go into some classrooms, they'll have a lot of um, color-coded work areas, work break areas, they'll have um, work jobs that are um, very organized into steps and sequences, and they're breaking those down into smaller parts, that kind of thing. Um, and then, what else? I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Does anybody have any other questions? But again, yeah, theory, theory of mind, did anybody hear Michelle Garcia Winters? is somebody that's really highly connected to theory of mind. And that is, um, it's a way of teaching, and they use it a lot of with um, older kids with Asperger's, okay, teenagers, adolescents. It's teaching them to understand the perspective of others. There's a lot of role play that is involved in this, okay? So what do we do in these social contexts and these situations? You will under understand that I'm standing this close to you. That's probably not taking into the perspective of the other person wants to do that, okay, or it needs to back up. So where do I stand? What do I say? How do I respond? Um, how does, do my responses when I'm looking down and I'm not listening or look like I'm looking over here, that, that really, that perspective from somebody else is that I don't care about what you're talking about or I don't want to be here. Um, and a lot of times that's not the truth. That's just what they, we do. But we're not really aware that our behaviors affect others in, in another way socially. 
Okay, so lateral plating. If you look up Michelle Garcia Winter, she's got a lot of information on that um, and, and programs that are used throughout the country. Can either of these be put like into a 504 plan for a child with autism Asperger's? Probably. Is, I mean, you could talk about that as an intervention that you're, you're wanting to seek out. Now, you know, the problem is, you know, again, getting people that are trained and getting the resources out to them. I know that the University of Iowa's resource library has all kinds of books and tapes of hers and Theory of Mind and almost all of these strategies that are free. And I put that as a resource in the back of your, they'll mail them to you for free. You can check them out. Um, they've just got about almost all the resources you could, there's something like, you should know this, I coordinated the center, how many? Um, over 2,000, I believe, um, resources there on just autism, autism spectrum, Asperger's, the whole gamut. I just going to mention we are in the process of developing our resource library here. So, yeah, so Lisa and I are connecting yes. to get a lot of those same books purchased here, and they will be housed here at Opportunity Village. So um, you can get with me if you want some of those resources. And a lot of them have videotapes, which is really great, and I'll show you how to do this, how to set up a social skills program, how to, how to teach theory of mind, how does that, what does that look like in a classroom? What does that look like one-to-one? -one? Okay, and that can be, you know, I learn really well through modeling. Okay, it can be very helpful. Okay, any other questions? So if you're using these, I think it's okay. What I would say is these probably shouldn't be the only thing that you're using. And remember, the comprehensive, autism is a very complex disorder, and so what I often find is I'm using multiple things with a family. Um, and probably most of them are gonna be evidence-based, but I use picture exchange, I've used Oddcom, teach strategies, all of these, um, many of these things that are here as part of an overall program, okay? But it's individually based. I, some kids that I work with don't do well with picture exchange. We do not, they just aren't doing well with that. It's been taught, but they don't like it. And so they do better with an iPad or with Oddcom in terms of how they communicate. Okay, so you have to look at preference and look at what that, child likes and what they're able to do. Um, and many kids that I have are really uh, motivated by the visual they get, the auditory they get, the feedback they get from Oddcom devices. And the iPads are really um, kind of cool things for some of these kids. All right, All right. Um, here's some of the unestablished. Okay, please don't throw me out of the room, all right? <laughs> but that first one, are there any occupational therapies here? I usually want people that I want to know who they are before I enter this crowd. Um, and I, I will tell you is I work very closely and have in the past. I know it's weird, behavior analysts and occupational therapists typically can have some very different ideas about how we teach and what we do with kids with autism. But we know, okay, if you're around um, young children with autism or any others, we know that they have sensory processing disorders, okay, or deficits, however you want to say it. Many of, most of these kids do, all right, if you spend any time there, and that's that they're either overly sensitive or, or they're, they're not sensitive at all to sensory stimuli coming in, the way that they process that information, auditory, tactile, visual, vestibular, motion kinds of things, okay? The problem is that there is just not evidence out there for sensory integration therapy. And what sensory integration therapy typically involves is doing an assessment of the sensory processing, okay? And what's usually done then is that a, a sensory diet is prescribed, and that can be things like using weighted vests, um, using brushing technique, have you heard of that? Where um, it can be deep pressure, I've heard of. Um, uh, Temple Grand and Squeeze Machine. I would probably put that under here, and I've met her a couple times, and we had some interesting conversations <laughs> about, about sensory integration therapy. Um, and so, you know, she's, she ought to know about some things, but, uh, those are the idea, the problem is is that they, what's claimed with this is really hard to study. So the claims from folks that use this and have um, published some studies, they're just not rigorous or don't meet the standard of, of, of science, is that they, the claims are that they change the mental processes. How do you, how do you um, observe that? How do you, def are you able to show that it changed mental processes? And that's been a big, a big issue. Um, so at this point in time, there's not a, there's not data to support that this works. You still, okay. uh, I still, still see that Iowa City Center for Disease and Disability Development. Uh -huh. They're still recommending that. Uh, yeah. Well, they might be occupational therapists, or maybe are probably the ones who are recommending it. Um, 
there's nothing to support it. I'm just, that's all at, at this point. So here's what I will say, okay? And if you're gonna, from a behavioral standpoint, I see a lot of these things as preferred activities for kids, okay? They do like them. They like the trampoline. They like, um, they like um, steep pressure. They like the balls being rolled on them and things. What I, from a behavioral standpoint, what I see often is that those are provided as a result of a kid tantruming and engaging in self-injurious behavior or problem behavior, okay? And so what I, I like to see when I work with occupational therapists is that they think this might help regulate some of their um, activity levels, okay? The flapping, the sensory kinds of things that are occurring is that those are scheduled at certain times of the day before times they seem to see the behaviors more often, not as a consequence. Because as a behaviorist, what I see oftentimes is kids learn that I really like this activity. I like the attention from the teacher. So it may not start out as something that's reinforcing attention maintained behavior, or they get pulled out of an academic task they don't want to do, and we go over and we do deep pressure, or we do this, and they learn really quickly that all I gotta do is escalate my behaviors, and I get, not only do I not have to do that, but I get all oh, this teacher attention, I get this cool thing that they do with me, all right? So it can turn into something that becomes a function of challenging behavior. Again, I can't, the, the research is not showing, some research actually shows when they looked at weighted vests for different specific behaviors and they looked at um, brushing, that it was like a placebo effect. So the behaviors that they asked the occupational therapists and the teachers that they were hoping to change to use this with didn't change the behavior at all, okay? So if you're gonna do these things, I think think proactively and just put them in the times, just have them happen, okay? Because if we really think that these are gonna help calm kids down, that they're going to um, help decrease some of the, the level of activity or increase, you know, kids that are kind of not wanting to do anything and they're not learning because they're, um, they're just not reacting, they're not responding, those kind of lethargic kids, which is what sensory integration is used for as well, then let's plan it in and let's do it on a regular basis in the hopes that from a preventative standpoint, we're using a strategy that's going to help them at those times of the day that we see more of those behaviors that may be difficult, where they are having difficulty processing all the information sensory-wise that's coming in. Okay, so as a behavior analyst, that's all I say, okay? Um, and the other thing I will, I will say about that is take data. Ask your teachers, what is the behavior? If you're using the, the way to vest for my son, what are you trying to change? And then show me that when you use that weighted vest that my student, my child stays in circle time for a longer period of time, doesn't get up and down as much, doesn't flap and rock as much, okay? Or have them ask for the weighted vest when they're calm and they start to kind of feel like they're getting really anxious or you start to see some of those initial behaviors that might lead to a lot of problems, okay? We can teach kids to ask us, Say, hey, I really want to use this. Or I want to go into the, I want to put the sock over me, okay? Um, like, you know what I'm talking about? They have these big kind of sock things. Um, I think some kids do like how that feels. And it, they feel good when they're in it. I don't know. Um, but let's have them ask in a proactive way before they have a tantrum, before they get upset. And then sure enough, you can go over there and do that. Yeah, especially if that's going to help you calm down. And you can come back to the activity and you can learn better. Okay, yeah. What I like about this I know. That's another thing I have. I don't, it's just, it's covering that, but it's not covering applied behavior analysis. And we have all these strategies. And so it's really hard for me because that's not following the evidence. And I don't, don't, don't have me talk about insurance companies. I've had too many meetings in the state with Walmart and other people telling me that ABA is not scientific, it's not evidence based, but we are doing this. And I said, well, everybody else, the professionals in the world, are saying that's not the case. So um, you're right now, it's just, a, it's, it's a real, it's a hot spot for me. Um, so that's, that is a problem. In Iowa, we still do not have ABA covered unless you're a, a state employee. If you're a state employee, you can have a certain amount of money. Um, I think it's $30,000 for the year to help cover ABA therapy, okay? Um, but if you're not, and it's still hard, and they fight us on it. It's hard to get, you do those claims, and it's just really hard to get the money, I'm going to tell you. Um, West Virginia, when I just left, we fought hard for years and got it covered. 
so it isn't covered by insurance. And a lot of um, that military um, Tricare is now paying really well for hourly ABA services. They pay eighty to hundred dollars for a BCBA to work, and they get so many hours a week. I think it's twenty five, something like that. So I think we're going to get there. I've been in a lot of legislative meetings, and um, anyway, I'm, I'm part of a group. We go every year. February is um, is Autism Awareness Day in Iowa. We go to the Capitol. We talk and talk and talk and talk and talk to the people there about how we need to have this covered for our families. So um, I've got cards if you want to join me. We're going to go for the, I don't know how many year in a row here. And we got close last year, but we didn't get it. But we're getting there. Okay? So there's no sensory integration involved with ADA or can it be? I wouldn't. Oh. doesn't follow any of the behavior strategies, and I never recommend it. But I'm not going to fight it necessarily. If you, I want to keep doing ABA strategies, but I'll say if you want to keep doing that, put it in the day, but don't do it reactively. So because most, of, I'm just going to tell you, most every teacher I work with, almost every um, family that I work with, are getting some type of sensory integration therapy, and it doesn't take a lot of effort. Is another thing. ABA takes a lot of effort. It's intense. It takes learning. Um, it doesn't. We don't have. We can't have. We don't get effects right overnight um, with, with it. So I think that's part of the, the thing. Um, it also puts less on us as therapists and the adults to do and more on the child. And so again, it's an easier easier thing to implement. I'm just that's that's my my observation. Yeah, yes. I would I would just say as the professional um, that over over the years, parents consistently say to me that sensory um, activities are one of the main things that they believe has helped has helped their child. So I often wonder whether the research is only as good as the questions and the alignment. Because often I see the same thing happening in schools with sensory integration um, that I see with behavioral function, where um, strategies are sensory strategies are used to calm a child down when they should be revving them up, or sensory strategies are used to rev a child up when they should be used to calming. <coughs> to calm them so down. When, it's when you implement them and in and what I, conditions. And I wonder if we were measuring reducing physical outbursts rather than just brain processing and advocating the research look at more aligned categories if we would get farther. Because I, I really feel, um, which is, I, and I understand ADA is like the platinum strategy in terms of evidence-based. I don't want to dilute that at all, but it's really discouraging to me as a practitioner that we aren't farther along in terms yeah. of validating sensory from what I see in the schools and what I have parents tell me. Because when it is used with the behavioral package as either reinforcement mm -hmm. or as a break proactively, I see it make tremendous difference. And, and I, I agree. Again, I can't, I can't say that when you have that many things you're doing, I mean, I think it just needs, what Temple Grandin, the conversation I had with her, <laughs> lucky enough to meet her, um, is she said that she just, she says behavior analysts are better researchers. They're better at defining behaviors. They take data more. They have better research. She said occupational, that, uh, the occupational therapy um, therapists and, the, and that group is just not as good at doing that. And I agree, I think when you, it's how you, it's the conditions under which you implement that, the, those and when you do it. And when you combine it together and if you're looking at function and you're using it as a reinforcement based strategy or a preventative strategy, I don't have a problem with it. I really don't and I, I think it could be very effective. Um, but I can't, I can't, I can't promote it as a professional at this point. Um, and it's definitely not where I would say start. Um, but, it, but I will just tell you that it's being used all the time. Okay, um, so just take data, okay? Let's see if we're getting the, the effects that we want. Um, and one thing I will say is it does calm kids down. 
And the reason I think it calls, cal calms kids down is because sometimes it's pulling kids out of activities they don't want to be in, escape and avoidance, and it's also providing positive reinforcement um, that these kids are wanting, they're motivated to get as attention in a preferred activity. And so we have to be very careful because even if that's not the function, that's where I see it happening. So it does calm the kids down right away, but it will maintain the behavior forever if you keep doing that. If you keep reinforcing the behaviors, the behavior will maintain. And so it's just sort of, uh, it's a lot of why people use timeout. It's because you get immediate um, results. The kids, but they're going to keep doing it over and over and over. What you don't get is that, and if you do, then, it, then you probably got something that's working. Okay, and that means time in is more reinforcing than time out. Okay? Just one caution. Yeah. American Academy of Academic does not recommend it for a regular use as a household toy. What is that sensory? Trampoline. The trampoline. It's very dangerous. It's in the sun and same toy. Oh, I see what you're saying. No, okay. Yeah, I'm just, it's an example that's been used in sensory integration therapy. So you heard it from a pediatrician. It's not a safe toy. And I would agree, based on my, my growing up, we had a big trampoline, a little trampoline. There's a lot of family accidents <laughs> that occurred. So, okay, thank you. Um, facilitated communication, people familiar with that at all? Okay, um, I hope you're not, actually. Um, it was actually used as augmentative communication strategy uh, and is still used. Um, still use. What um, it is is basically a way where an adult um, helps or facilitates communication with uh, a, an individual. Okay, it doesn't have to just be kids with children with autism. And what they do is they lead, there's usually a, either a, an alphabet board or um, usually that's what I see and they're spelling out, okay, and somebody gently facilitates. They kind of guide the hand or hold on to the hand of the person and they answer questions or they talk to you by pointing, spelling words, spelling out sentences. And what they found is they've done um, several studies, line studies, and what they found was that it was the person, the adult who was communicating, the facilitator who was communicating, not the child. Okay, so this is something that I just, and actually there were abuse cases that were um, reported and went to ruin people's lives. Um, because the facilitator facilitated that there was a, uh, either sexual or emotional abuse that occurred that did not happen. Okay, so it's one that I hope we don't see too much anymore, but I actually, the first classroom I worked in was a paraeducator that was being used. So it was a long time ago. I'm older. So um, gluten and casein free diets. Um, this is used a lot. There's no gluten is uh, you know, a byproduct of wheat, uh, it's in um, barley, oats. Uh, it's a protein, basically it's found in wheat, rye, barley, what else, um, oats. Uh, and um, it has been shown to be connected to um, uh, gastrointestinal problems and also neurodevelopmental problems. Um, there's nothing, to, this has not been shown to really have any effects on behaviors with kids with autism that are autism specific, right, to this point. Um, and then casein is a protein found in milk, so casein free diet. Had a lot of families that have been very much on this and I will tell you it's pretty stressful for the families because these kids get really upset when you these diets are really hard to follow and many of these kids have very restricted um, foods that they eat um, anyway and I have seen it cause more um, problem behavior in families it's just hard it's hard to implement and so it's not an easy route to go so you really want to make sure um, that if you're going to do that, go to and get go to make sure you get tested for having a gluten allergy. Um, take your child to a doctor and see if they do have an allergy to gluten or to casein before you, you use this. If you're going to think about that, and do the pediatricians want to add anything on that that end? Can um, actually sometimes cause a harm like malnutrition. Yeah. Yes, because they're not. He said malnutrition, and I actually worked with a family who that was that was happening. Um, lost a lot of weight was not getting um, foods in, in the diet, and he ended up actually in, in the hospital for a while. He had a lot of, a lot of issues. And this is in West Virginia. Huh? Yeah. to move on high, high, high doses of D3 by the gone away? Um, I luckily haven't heard a lot of families doing that yes. recently. So vitamin, he's talking, talking about vitamins. High doses of vitamins, again, has not been. Vitamin B, and what did you say? D3. D3, um, and there are, are there a few others that have been, there's some ideas that if you have high doses of that, that can help change some of the behaviors that you see with autism. And again, there's nothing to support that that's had an effect um, on that. Okay? 
Yes. <laughs> sure. So you can actually end up, yes, if you hear that, like a false negative, if you don't get tested, you can, um, you can have problems when you go to get, if you start it without being tested, then you can go get tested, and um, you can show that maybe you are when you're not, okay. You're also testing to confirm vitamin D deficiency as well, if you're interested in, mm -hmm. in supplementation, if they already have market food aversion, this, you know, goes, kind of goes hand in hand, that they probably would be deficient Yeah, go to a doctor and get, get those tests if you're going to think about that. But again, is what we know about having an effect on behaviors that are related to autism right now, there's nothing to really support that they will help How about or change. Diets? What's that? Candida diets? That's where you're... I don't know what that is. Oh. So it, it's falling in the magical wand treatment for me because I'm not sure what that is and I haven't seen anything read. But I don't mean that negatively. I, I, I haven't heard of that. So I'm, I'm guessing if it's not in that it's probably an established or emerging, then it's probably not got any research at this point or good research to show. Okay, Okay. so one thing I just wanted to show you, this is an article that came out in 2006. Um, so it's getting a little old now. It's probably, this is probably, we need to keep that in mind. Okay, so things that may change. But here are a lot of treatments and the rank is how often they're used. Okay, so if you look in that third column, current use, you can see that speech therapy, you know, I don't know what, how that was defined. It could be defined in a lot of different ways. Visual schedules, 43%. You can see sensory integration used a lot. It's the third most, was the third most highly used intervention um, based on this study. And then it looks at um, current use, and then it looks at past use. And look where applied behavior analysis is, and that just may be not enough people out there to do it. I don't know. Um, and it's expensive sometimes in getting people trained. But they've got vitamin <coughs> C, vitamin B, um, things, casein-free diets. You can see that they're used, right? Uh, even though they don't fall in evidence base. Now, when you look at this, um, these are, again, highlighted, these are treatments that the red that lack scientific evidence, okay? So all I'm just showing here is that there's, even, there's research to show that a lot of these um, non-evidence-based practices are being used, okay? And um, so science is not really always popular, okay? So what we say is scientific and evidence-based doesn't mean that people are, are using it. And again, I think because a lot of times some of these um, practices are more, take more effort. Okay, they're harder, they take more skills to be able to do. So I just again, I want to make sure that just because everybody's doing it, doesn't mean that it's going to be effective for your child. All right? um, and so again, all I can say is take data, define a behavior or behaviors that you want to see increase or decrease, and let's see if what we're doing is helping. Okay, and then you can show me the data, and I'll say there's a lot in schools and with families, and we've even done things like all the families, I'll say, well, just keep doing that. If I, if I don't think it's harmful, if I don't think it's really expensive and it's something that they're losing their life savings over, I'll say, you, you keep doing that for these two days, okay? And why don't I work on this? Let's use and let's see if we have one that maybe is more effective than the other. Okay, and that's another way to look at it so that we, we do want to see that, and then we can make a decision after that. Okay, so I think one of the biggest dilemmas that we see for families, and I've given you some of this information, and I'm going to go into detail about functional communication training here in a little bit, is that the hard thing is there's no single treatment. You saw all of those. Not, we can't say that ABA is good for every child. I've had some kids that aren't responding well to some of the interventions that we use within applied behavior analysis. We have to, the street trial isn't working well, we've got to try more of a naturalistic based intervention, okay, where it's child-led versus adult-led, okay, play-based a little bit more. Um, we might have to use more schedules, we might have to use other types of things. So even with an applied behavior analysis, the same treatment is not going to work for everybody and every student, and it's, it's with all of these. So just keep coming back to the data and to asking the people that are the professionals that are working with your kids, you yourself, doing taking data to see, is, are you seeing the behaviors that you want to see when this intervention over time is being implemented?
okay? There's also a lack of consensus, okay? So you've heard occupational therapists and, and behavior analysts don't always agree on what or how we should implement certain things, whether we should use sensory integration therapy. Um, these are professionals, and it's paid for by, by um, insurance companies. So um, that makes it difficult for you guys in terms of choosing. But again, I look at those, look at the, what we know, look at what um, multiple groups that are, um, our, our professionals across the nation are saying. We bring medical people together, we bring um, other professionals in the field that know a lot about autism and about these interventions. Um, and then the websites and the media. Um, my mother always sends me, probably once a month I get a, um, she knows what I do for a living. I love her to death. Um, she's got a lot of time, she's retired. And she sends me lots of emails, and I get just like, you just see this. And one was a facilitated communication. And she, you know, she's just trying to help out, wants to know. Um, but it can be really dangerous, you know, some of these things that are out there. And so just like we tell our kids when you're surfing the net, um, stick to these kinds of things. And um, there are, you know, again, there are websites that you probably want to stick to when you're looking um, um, at, at different treatments for autism. Um, the other thing is that all research is good research. So when I talked a little bit about studies, and, and this is what I, I'm trained to do, and I still can pick up some, some studies, and it takes me a while, and, I, and I'm trying to figure out, is this a good study or not? So just because we say it's research-based doesn't mean they use the high-quality design to be able to show. So it doesn't mean it's truth. It doesn't mean that it's really showing us that the behaviors that were changed were really changed based on the intervention that was used or whatever the strategy was. So that's hard. So again, there's some ideas in that the National Standards Project that there's a, a pamphlet for, for families and I put the, the, um, the website I think in the back of the very last page. They have some idea, they'll help you kind of walk through that if you, if you are looking at specific studies and you're trying to look. Um, so, even all that, it sounds very negative, doesn't it? And I don't mean it to, because I think on the positive side, there are things that we can do. So, your being here is educating yourself. You've got a list of things you're starting to hear about the terminology, you're starting to hear, well, at least what do I ask for? And you can look up and you can read about those things. Okay, so that's really important. Um, and then identifying programs. This is the hard part. And professionals that have the training um, in some of these evidence-based strategies. Okay. Um, that's hard here. Okay, your teachers are going to have some of the skills um, that were talked about. There are places across the state that I can talk to you more about if you want. Pockets where they have people that are trained behaviorally to do things. Um, in that social skills, there are different groups out there um, that are doing it. Uh, and that, and then you can also try to learn yourself. Um, there's a lot of workshops that are provided for parents that teach these skills to parents. And I know they're expensive sometimes and and that kind of thing. Um, but I've had, Christine is a really good um, example of, she went to the workshop, she's implementing the program at home with her kids because she can't find anybody to be able to do it here. And I know that everybody has the time and there's just so many variables involved here. Um, but I think educating and at least knowing what to ask for and trying to identify who might be able to help provide some of those services. And again, you don't have to have all of those, okay? And it's gonna be some things and some not, but um, you can kind of pick and choose. Data, 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 okay? So whoever you're working with, um, they should be able to show you progress when you ask for it. Um, and then you should be able to talk about what to do if there's not progress. <coughs> this is something I think is really important. Um, the match for you and your family, okay? I work with a lot of families in, and discrete trial training and some of the behavioral programs that we use just isn't a real good match for them. It's not um, an approach that they are comfortable with Sometimes uh, for some of the ABA therapies, I think, um, and other, and even other ones. So um, look at what's going to work well with your family in terms of your time, the setting. Where can you do it? Do you can you do it at home? Does it have to be done at school? What does your life look like, and where can you, you know, where are you going to be able to implement some of these interventions um, in the community? Um, financially, you have to think about, you know, risk there. Um, I've had families that have put houses up for mortgage for things that aren't even evidence-based. And I really struggle with that um, for them and, and things. So you have to think about, again, if, I don't know if you're, if you're like me, I don't have a lot of money, so I have to be very careful about where I spend it and what I do with it. And so that's something to be think about. And then those, those is it, could it be harmful? 
okay? A lot of times, you know, with, with some of the therapies, if I know families are doing other things that are evidence-based, um, and so maybe some of the sensory integration, it's not harmful, there's not getting in the way, they're, they're planning it in, they're structuring it, it's not hurting, then I'm okay with that, okay? Um, but those are some things to think about. Is it an approach that you feel like you, you can do? Okay, and again, I have a lot of families that really like some more of the naturalistic because it fits better into their home during a snack time, during a play time, during free time, that it, is, it makes more sense for them than maybe sitting down and having to set up a part of your house where you're doing some back and forth, um, more structured type of, of behavioral intervention. That might be more difficult um, for families. Okay, uh, focus on behaviors. All right, and I just kind of want to end with the, we're almost done with the, the intervention part, and then I'll move on. We'll take another probably break because time is moving fast. Uh, and then I'll talk about functional communication training. All right, right now there's no treatment for autism. Okay, for, for autism itself, we're treating the behaviors that come with autism. Challenging behavior, attentional problems, social skills, communication, language, um, repetitive behaviors, maybe hyperactivity with some kids. Okay, those are the things that you want to keep your eye on. And so again, when families ask me, where do I start, what should I do, the first question I ask them, was, what are some of the, the three, top three behaviors that you're finding challenging or that you want to change, your increase or decrease with your child, and that's how I start the conversation. Once we can narrow that down, then I can talk about interventions that may match those behaviors that I know fall in that evidence-based category. All right, does that make sense? So think behaviorally, don't think of what do I do for autism. And every child is different. So every, every treatment package is going to look different because it's going to be based on behaviors. I have kids that are highly strong in academics. They're testing out academically no matter what age they're at with autism. But socially they cannot walk up and initiate a conversation. So what are we going to, are we going to focus on academics? Probably not. We're going to focus on social skills training, language-based programs, that um, peer groups, kinds of things, peer-mediated programs, maybe some video modeling to help get some of those behaviors. And then I have other families that severe challenging behaviors are number one because we can't get that child to do anything else because the behaviors are so severe that they're isolated. So we're going to concentrate on behaviors that decrease challenging behaviors and increase other appropriate behaviors. Okay, let's take a break. Um, Sure. Yeah. From a medical standpoint, um, just because you were talking about the gluten and casein free and the comment was made about getting tested, there are very good valid tests for um, gluten allergy and there is a valid test for vitamin D deficiency. But I think that your comments about making sure everything's or things are evidence based are really important when people take their child to a medical provider and a medical provider um, or practitioner recommends testing. Um, I don't know for sure what um, was referred to. Um, I think um, you were talking about a yeast diet. Um, uh, and there Canada. are, yeah, in Canada. Um, there are a lot of practitioners that do a lot of not valid tests. Um, so just because it's a blood test or a, a urine test or a stool test doesn't make it valid. Um, Certainly kids with autism can have lead poisoning, and kids with autism can have celiac disease. Um, but uh, there are plenty of practitioners who do lots of tests. So when you seek medical information, be sure that your, um, your practitioner is using evidence-based things. And I think you still can refer to the American Academy of Pediatrics website <coughs> to see if those things are valid. Um, a mom just sent me a link um, her child has anxiety, and on one of the national news um, uh, programs recently, a doctor talked about a urine test to look for a metabolite of Clostridium. Well, this is not a validated thing, but of course she saw it on the news, so it seems like it must be a reasonable thing, and he talked about all of his great results and everything else. So I, that's, that's my only aside commentary. Be sure that um, your health practitioner is using valid testing and making valid recommendations for, for what you should do. 
and can they, the American Academy of Pediatrics, I mean, that's where I go a lot for information, and we have brochures for them about autism and treatment and, and uh, assessment and that kind of thing. So that, that's a website that's on there that I really um, would recommend if you're not sure. And it's hard. I mean, if you can't go to your doctor and you, they're not using it, that's how are we supposed to know that? So that's, um, I think, asking, and you're starting with some of that stuff there. Okay, let's take a five-minute break at least, and then we'll, we'll get started again, okay? Come back, we'll be using a yellow packet, and you can see the videos. It'll be a little bit more, I hope, active. Really see what happens in each one of you know some of these, and you can see it in action, and you can get a little bit more information about how you might do that. That wasn't sort of the focus of this. It was just to get the information out on where do you start and what do you look for, and what do you ask for with that. But I think there's this is um, the very beginning. I hope what ends up bringing back more and more people here um, to give you some advice and guidance. Okay, so I'm going to talk. Um, about functional communication training, and that is one applied behavior analysis strategy. So when you go on, to, if you look at project, um, uh, the I'm sorry, the National Standards Project, where I got a lot of the information. If you look at other websites there, this will be mentioned under behavioral packages. Okay, um, this goes way back. There's over 30. There's probably 40 years of, of research. No, 30 something of research on functional communication training, and it's been used for all age groups. It's been used for individuals with autism. It's been used for individuals um, with developmental disabilities, uh, with, um, uh, with not intellectual disabilities, but more just behavior disorders kinds of things. Um, but probably most of the research is in autism and developmental disabilities, all right? When I try to describe what this is, I like to use a cartoon. I've had this for so long now, I think I'm getting, <laughs> I need to find something new, but I can't find one as good as this one. Um, and this is a Peanuts um, cartoon, and it's a little bit fuzzy, so I'll kind of read it to you. It says, Linus says, let's see now, how can I put it into words? What I mean is, or what I want to say is, how can I put it into words? I'm trying to say, and this is Lucy, we all know Lucy, and poor, she hits Linus, gives him a big smack, and she says rats, I was hoping, or he says rats, I was hoping she could put it into words. This is really sort of um, the group of, children that I work with a lot, okay? Kids that may have, some have language, some are completely nonverbal. Uh, some kids have language but just choose not to use it because they found that challenge behaviors get them what they want a little bit quicker than having to stop and actually ask for things or communicate um, verbally. Uh, so what I oftentimes, um, I start out is I'm asked to come in and work with kids that have some severe, some challenge behavior. It can be tantrums, it can be self-injurious behavior, so eye poking, biting their hands. Um, I've worked with kids that have actually um, poked their eyes so much that their retina has been detached. They've had to have surgery. Um, I worked with a family, kids, uh, two boys that had Lush 9 disease. Have you heard of that? Oh, I'm sorry, Lush 9 syndrome. And that one of the big um, uh, characteristics of that is biting um, in their fingers. And the flesh, and so these kids, these two boys, had bit the fingers down to where it, I mean, it was a, they had to cover their hands because they were missing part of uh, their fingers. So really severe, but then also just kids that are dropping to the floor and not transitioning, 
and screaming or crying or maybe throwing something or ripping up their paper. So it covers, challenge behavior is very broad, right? It can be more mild forms, but it can also be more severe. Again, I've worked with adults um, in group home settings uh, who are sending people to the hospital, okay? The behaviors are um, instead of using other types of communication skills. So the, high, the idea behind functional communication training is what we think about is that most behaviors communicate something. Okay, they have a communicative message, and we say that all, most all behaviors do. So whether it's problem behavior, whether it's appropriate communication, um, whether it's um, how I stand, my gestures, but this is communicating something. There's some intent from the person who is um, using that behavior. So we look at problem behavior as behavior analysts as a communicative response. It's just not an appropriate communicative response. It's not the one that we want to see. Uh, and so the, the premise behind this is that if we can teach kids or adults to use some alternative form that's more appropriate, a way to communicate, okay, that we should over time, and what we do know with this, um, with this treatment, is that we see that appropriate communication starts to increase and those problem behaviors start to decrease. Okay? And we'll talk about why that occurs, and, and I'll show you some videos here in a little bit. So, why is this important? Why would you want to use this? At, this is actually from, um, taken from some research that they did, is that challenge behaviors are the most commonly reported reason parents of children with autism seek services. And I can, I can through my own experience of coordinating the Autism Center and years of doing this, I didn't start out working with kids with autism. I started out to work with kids adults, even kids without disabilities that I do now who have challenging behavior, but 90% of the population that I work with now tend to kind of gear towards autism. So we know it's heavily a, a, a population of kids that tend to have challenging behavior. Anybody want to know why? Why do you think that is? Why is autism so related to challenging behaviors? Yeah, one of the, the primary characteristics of autism is lack of or poor social communication skills. So that is something that's part of at a very young age we start seeing. And if you, I always think about it, if you could not let people know what you wanted, how frustrating that would be. If you ever have to do that, if you've ever been in a class, um, I, I've taught um, some odd comm classes uh, at the university level, and one of, the, one of the first things I have people, students do is pretend they can't talk. They have to try to deliver a message without talking, without writing, without anything else. And most of them get really frustrated and give up after a minute, you know, after five minutes, okay? So if you think about that, that's a real issue. So the other thing that we know, if these behaviors are untreated, they persist. They usually don't just go away. So um, oftentimes we'll say, well, just let them they'll grow out of it. But this population, that's usually not the case, okay? The behaviors tend to get worse and kids get bigger and they get stronger, and it also leads to a lot of parental stress and family stress. Um, I work with families that have three children on the spectrum, all at different levels, um, many families, and many of those kids were all engaging in problem behaviors or different things. You walk into those households, and I, you sometimes don't know how they get up every day and how they do it, um, because it's just chaos, and it's not their fault, and so we come and try to help, but. I'm always, I leave and I think I will never fully understand, I can never understand what these families go through. Uh, and even with just one child. So um, it's very stressful. And they're also again correlated again with that communication. Okay, so why is it so effective? FCT is just really, really effective. We've got more evidence probably for that within applied behavior analysis strategies as a treatment than many of the other ones. Um, one is that it's very proactive. Okay, so I love teachers should use this because it's what we know how to do, all right? It's, it involves teaching new skills and not just focusing on that disruptive behavior, all right? Sometimes I think we get so focused on the problem behavior that we're not thinking about how to decrease it. We're not, if we don't teach individuals what to do instead, they're not going to, they won't know what to do. And they're more likely to continue to engage in these behaviors that they know how to do, okay, that are more efficient for them. Um, you can take it wherever you go. So it can be done at grandparents' house, it can be done in the community, it can be done uh, in schools, in the work environments. You can take it everywhere, okay? Um, and we know that it reduces challenging behaviors that implemented consistently and over time, okay? It also gives individuals and children some control of their environment. 
and that one I really like in terms of um, self-determination and just independence. Um, again, it's, I can't, if I don't have a way to communicate, what choices do I have? How can I make choices about what's going to happen to me in my life? And what goes on, and so many of these individuals don't get a lot of choice. People are making choices for them all the time. And so I think this is kind of a powerful tool to be able to let, you know, teach kids, you tell me in an appropriate way what it is that you need. And we'll go from there. Okay. So um, here's what we know about challenge behavior, is that it usually serves a purpose. So when we do those functional behavioral assessments, um, sometimes we do what's called a functional analysis. And that is um, setting up situations in the environment where you're most likely to see the behaviors, and then we're actually manipulating how we respond to those behaviors to see if when they occur more and when um, we don't see them. Okay, it's called a functional. It's a, it's a, um, a, a functional behavioral assessment or functional analysis. So we know that when we do this, that usually we usually see it's to gain attention from people. We see that a lot. As soon as we turn away, we say, "Oh, go play by yourself for a little bit." Mom's got to talk to the phone or do her work on the computer, and we'll, we'll actually set those up in some of these assessments. And sure enough, after a second or two, sometimes it's right away for kids. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. They might scream, yell, bite their hand, um, throw something, and what t typically happens? What are you going to do if you're a good parent? You're going to attend to that. You don't want to have that happen. You know, I'm sorry. I, I don't do my work right now. Let me. Mom's going to come over and hang out with you for a little bit. That's the typical sequence that we see. Because you, especially with self-injurious behavior and really aggressive behavior, because that's a horrible thing to see a child do to themselves. So we stop quickly, and, and we go over, and we're going to do whatever we can to get that behavior to stop. And that if it's attention maintained, if that's what the purpose, the function is, you know, I've seen it just be a light switch for kids. Just a light switch. The, the minute you come over, they're happy as can be. I've seen kids go from a full, all ground cry, tears and everything, to smiling and laughing in seconds. Now, it's not always that clear, but I do see that quite a bit, okay? And then you walk away, and sometimes I've barely taken a step, and it starts up again, okay? So those are the kinds of things we're looking at. Um, we also know that children, you can't, the function changes depending on the child. So one thing that we learned behaviorally over the years, and we've gone past, I think, behavior modification, is that we used to just use interventions based on the behavior, not based on the function. So we had interventions for aggressive behavior and self-injurious behavior, but it wasn't looking at the intent of why individuals were doing what they were doing. So we weren't doing a great job. It was hit or miss as to whether our interventions were actually really working. Um, so we know that they'll be different. Okay. So for one child, they're going to use other. They're going to have other reasons for why they're being problematic than another child. So the treatment that we use or how we do things is going to be different. We can't say the same thing's going to happen for every child that we see with aggressive behaviors because the function is going to be different. Okay, so heavily based on that. Um, last thing is it's often the easiest way for children with speech difficulties to communicate. Okay, again, um, they can be disruptive pretty easily. And that usually gets a reaction. And it usually gets a very immediate one. And the younger they are, the quicker people run and come over. Okay, so it becomes a learned behavior very quickly, and they have studies where infants will show this with crying, okay, um, and they can, they can see a difference. Okay, so there's this really big link between communication and challenge behavior, and especially for this population. Um, we look at challenge behavior as communicating several um, social messages, all right, you can think about it that way, and that's, we talk about gaining something positive. That can be attention, it can be a preferred activity, it can be food, something that's given when the child engages in problem behavior. That's called positive reinforcement, right? And then we also see kids and adults engaging in um, disruptive behaviors to avoid or escape things. And I've talked about that quite a bit today, so I'm going to kind of move on um, with that. What do I do? You may see what I do. Thanks. <laughs> this is bad. Okay. Um, so we have to talk about ABCs of behavior, okay? Antecedents, behaviors, consequences. This is the way that we identify what the function is for that individual child. This is part of a functional behavioral assessment. And oftentimes we'll just have, I'll have parents. I have these really easy data forms. They're just open-ended A, B, C, and I'll have them each time or from time to time for a week or so when a behavior occurs that they're, um, that's challenging, they're going to say, what was happening when that behavior started? 
while we were at lunch and I had to answer the phone. I walked away. Or I asked my child to pick up their toys. Or somebody came in from, um, uh, one of my other children came over and I was doing something with them. Okay? Antecedent, what happens before the behaviors occur? What is the context when this started? What was the trigger? That's what we're trying to get at. And I say, write down what happened. What did the behavior look like? Well, through the toy. Smacked the brother, okay? Um, yelled at me, okay? Something like that. Dropped to the floor. Lots of things can go in there. And then number C is, what did you do? What did people around them do? Well, I went over and couldn't get them to pick up the toys, so I just said, forget about it, and I picked them up later. Because we didn't have time, we had to run out and do something. Um, or we had company coming over. So when we start looking at that, we start seeing patterns. And we start seeing that our responses, what I always tell people is I really, my job is not to train and to work with kids and to change their behavior, it's to change adult behavior. And this is what's really hard, okay? Because kids are a lot easier to work with than adults. Because we have patterns and we're rigid and we do things and we have a hard time of changing what we do. And the older we are, the harder it is to change the behavior. But that's really what I do is I work with identifying what the function is, and I get parents to help me with that, okay? And teachers and other practitioners. When we can start to see these patterns, then we can start to say, hey, I think it really is about getting attention, or I think it's about getting out of any type of doing, getting dressed in the morning, okay, to avoid that. So that's the first step. It's all about function. And we've got to figure out what motivates that, that child, that individual. So here's some examples, just everyday kind of examples. This is one in the home and community that I hear all the time. When I work with families, um, we've got, again, I already talked about this, child leaves to make dinner, the parent leaves to make dinner, the child throws toy, screams. Um, I had a little, little girl that was following the parent around and just tantruming and pulling at her clothing and just went on and on and on and on and on for a long time. Um, and so we might hypothesize, because the parent, the way the parent responds, they're gonna attend to their child for a little bit. It might just be a little bit and they go back. Okay, um, but we might hypothesize that attention in this situation is really what's motivating the behavior. Okay, um, and then the store one is the second one. That's one I see a lot. It's really embarrassing when you're in a store and you have. I'm embarrassed for people. <laughs> I do this for a living, and I take people to the stores and we work on this stuff. And I've been there with kids tantrum like crazy, and it's embarrassing. And I still feel like, oh, you know, after doing this for like 20 or 30 years. Um, so we, we try to alleviate that. So how many times do you see somebody say, okay, you can, um, here it is, I throw it in the bag. And they've done, they've given it based on tantrum behavior escalations. Okay, it's what we, we're comfortable doing. It's a lot harder to do the other and say, forget about it, because you're going to have an escalation probably. Okay, here's some examples of avoidance, what we call negative reinforcement. The most common one at school, academic work. Okay, something, it doesn't have to be academic, but it's just something directed by the adult that kids need to do. All right, we see a lot of tantrums, we see a lot of negative behavior, and the timeout thing is used 90% of the time. Okay, and again, this is not going to be an effective strategy if they don't want to do this. Right, we've removed the aversive, um, what we're thinking is aversive, or what they don't want to do. All right, okay, one last example. I think this is picking up toys. This is one of my colleagues girls who used to have a lot of tantrums, actually. He hates saying that because he's a psychologist, a child psychologist, so he uses her frequently. She's doing great now, but they had quite a, quite a beginning, and picking up toys was not something she wanted to do. Um, so there's some examples there, okay? So the first step, I'm going to go through some steps, and I'm going to show you some videos of two boys that I work with, two twins with autism in Louisville in their home. Um, it's not that difficult to, to put this in place. Um, the hard thing is when the behaviors escalate, and they usually do the first time we change the rules. Okay, so you have to have some things in place of what are we going to do, how are we can pr protect a child if the behaviors are really severe so they don't get hurt, or they, so we can get through this burst of behavior that we oftentimes see. Um, and that depends on, again, the, the level of the, of the behavior, how intense it is. But the first step is that we do this functional behavioral assessment. That's observable data, that's taking ABC data, it's sometimes interviewing um, staff to try to get at function, when, how often, under what conditions, what activities, what settings, and what do other people do in response. And then sometimes we actually do, we come in and we set up a more, um, we, we do something called a functional analysis, and that has to be done by a professional. But we go in and we actually set up these conditions, 
and when we see the behaviors, we provide whatever we think it is that the parents told us they want, and then we kind of do this back and forth, and what we typically see, so we actually are reinforcing the behaviors during this very brief assessment, and we're looking for patterns of responding, and we get some pretty clean data a lot of the times to say, when we remove attention, woo, this kid gets excited, and we have a lot of problem behaviors. When we ask them to do something, we have a lot of problem behaviors, and when we do the timeout thing, they stop, okay? So it really validates what parents are telling us in a very um, structured way. Okay, so um, once we've done that, then we can make some guesses and some hypotheses as to what, what we think is going on. And if we do a functional analysis, we've really basically not just guessed anymore. Um, that type of assessment we've, pro we've shown through data and through a systematic um, design that that's really what's going on. Okay, but you don't have to go that far. Step two is that now we've got to figure out what are we going to teach this kid. Okay, so. If we've got a child that is nonverbal and doesn't have a way to speak verbally, and we think that um, attention is the, the behavior that we're, we're, the behaviors are occurring for, we've got to teach that child how to ask for attention. Okay, that we're no longer going to use that problem behavior. It might be using a switch with kids that are nonverbal that you press a button and it says, Mom, come back and play with me. It might be using a picture that they exchange and they bring it over to Mom and it says play. Okay. Um, it might be words, and we're gonna, we know this child can do words, but maybe it's a visual that tells them what to say, and we're gonna, re we're gonna reinforce that. So we set up situations, we choose uh, um, whatever the, the message is gonna be, but it has to match whatever the function was. So if it's work-related, and they wanna avoid something, we might teach a child to say, I wanna take a break for a minute, okay? And that, again, can be done it's based on what's the best way for that individual to communicate. So you have to work sometimes with your speech pass, work with what your child can already do, how they can communicate, and I'll show you with the two boys that I work with. They had verbal speech but didn't use it very often, and they were trained to use pictures. And so that's what we used, okay? Um, but the big thing is you have to provide whatever it is that they're looking for when you practice this, okay? immediately when they respond in an appropriate way, okay? And that's the hard part, because if you're a parent and you're trying to cook dinner, that's not when I would actually try this. I would actually start out and set up practice situations, and that's what we do with families. So when you really have to get meal done, or you've got to run to the store or something, this is not the time to practice this, because you're not going to be able to give the attention that you need to. And so we set up situations where we, we can ignore for a little bit, okay? And when, as soon as they communicate, we show them how to do it, then we can attend to them for a while. We can play, we can do whatever, okay? School thing, too, with teachers, it's really hard because they'll say, well, why are you, why don't we let them not do this? We're going to give them a break card, and they don't have to do the work, but it's school. We start there. So we've got to first disrupt that relationship. We've got to teach them, you just ask me in an appropriate way, you know what, the work's going to go away for a little bit, okay? We do that for a while, but it's not where we stop. Then we say, you know what? You had to do that one math problem for me first. You do this one problem, and then you can ask me and tell me you want a break. And then we slowly start building that up, and they get in this back and forth where they are getting reinforcement, but they're getting it for an appropriate way to communicate. So sometimes we have to go way back, and then we increase that. Okay? Is that making sense? Is that process discrete trial or pivotal? What is that? Functional communication training. Um, I, yeah, I just, it's really not a discrete trial, but it involves reinforcement. So it is a discrete trial. It involves kind of structuring things um, and looking at and setting things up. So it has some of that, but it's, it's really functional communication training is what I would call this process. This is the intervention. This is the treatment, okay? Um, I got to move fast because we only have till four. So here's what we end up doing. So if you look at those situations, and I'm going to skip to the video and kind of get through some things. So at snack time is one where we, we work on functional communication and training a lot because I have a lot of kids that are motivated by food, right? They want to ask for things. It's a good teaching time. But if they don't get it right away or they don't know how to ask and you're working with a group of kids maybe at snack time or at your family, you get a lot of problem behavior because it's not immediate. So we'll work on kids maybe um, if they want to leave, which I get a lot too, if we're asking to gain food, we'll give them something, a way to ask for us, okay? So again, it might be a card, it might be signing, sign language, which we teach a lot of kids. It might be words. Um, in this one, I work with kids that don't want to eat. Sometimes they, oh, they eat really quickly, but they don't want to stay at the table. 
So we might teach a child to sign all done instead of tipping over their, their milk or their juice. I had a boy that I worked with, this is what he'd do when he was ready to leave. He'd sit there quickly and the juice thing would be all on the floor. And so we had to intervene and say, you know what, I think you're ready to go. Before he started doing that, you tell us that you want to go and we'll let you go. Okay? And so those are some things. Um, so we're, the behavior now becomes that appropriate communicative response, that functional communication, which can be lots of different things, right? It's going to depend on what that child can do verbally or what other type of way we can teach them to communicate. Okay? Um, and the form has to do with what it is that you're actually teaching. So there's the message. What do I want to teach them to say? Okay? Or what does we want that device to say? And then what do we want to use? Pictures, signs, voice output devices, those kinds of things are all involved in functional communication training. Okay? I'm going really quick here. Sorry. Um, all right. Then we have to teach it. And that's that systematic way that I'm talking about. And I'm going to skip on so that we can get to the videos. There's one really important thing here. Okay? Um, it's really, and this is a terminology that fits under applied behavior analysis. It's called extinction. When we start doing functional communication training, we can never give in to challenge behavior, okay? So that means what I tell parents is if you can't follow through with a tantrum or with a really intense behavior, then we shouldn't practice it right now, okay? Because we have to, we have to ignore that or we have to do something else, all right? Um, if we give in to it, we're going to have, we're never going to get the behaviors to change. And that's really difficult. I work with kids that weigh 300 pounds. And they have really very significant behaviors, and they put people in the hospital. So that's why sometimes we have to really go way back. And you know what? You don't even have to do anything for me. You just tell me what it is you want, and I'm going to let you do it. And then we're going to work on slowly, over time, increasing what it is that we're asking you to do Okay, before you communicate. So it can be a longer process. Sometimes it can go very quick. Um, if you see the problem behavior, and what I see a lot of kids do is they'll sign really great, Sign please, or they'll say they want it, they'll hand you a card that says I want a break, and then they'll have a tantrum. All right? And if that happens, we have to treat it as if they haven't used appropriate communication. All right? And the reason is, is that that can be tied to um, the problem behavior that becomes part of the appropriate response. If I say, okay, oh, good job, you, you, you said, you, said um, you handed me the card and you said I want you to come over, and then I hit myself, then I've reinforced that whole chain of responses. So that child may think, all I have to do is hand you the card, but I can still go ahead and headbang. And does that make sense? And then we're reinforcing it. So what we have to do is if that happens, and it happens a lot, treat it as if it's all problem behavior, and we're going to try again. Okay? We're going to go back. I'm going to remove my attention, and then I'm going to give you the opportunity to ask, and if you can do it without self-injury, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reward that. And they learn very quickly that that's the deal. Okay? Um, at least sometimes you do. Okay, I would say the majority of the time it doesn't take too long. Okay, so here's the two kids that I want to talk about. They're, both, they're seven years old. Um, they had a lot of behaviors, uh, screaming, a lot of tantrums. This was at home. There's some of the aggressive behaviors that they engaged in, and then there's some self-injurious behaviors. They had a lot going on. Uh, you're going to see really mild behaviors, and sometimes what I do is I do not take the most severe behavior because I don't want them to escalate that. So what you're going to see is these little boys are kind of whining and going, ah! a little bit of screaming, and that's the behavior that we're um, intervening with, okay? We're not going to wait until they escalate the behaviors really high, but they could go to that. So I just wanted you to know what we observed. Um, Vincent, I think, was more verbal than Freddie, but again, they both weren't very reliable with their words, um, and they had a real good history of using pictures, and so we used picture exchange. Um, that's why we chose that. And what we found was, when I started working with this family, I said, what's your priority? We worked on a lot. They said, what's the number one thing? Where are we going to start? And they said, we've gone through four VCRs in a year. And we had to bring a VCR from our house to do this because they didn't have one anymore. Um, and what they like to do is that's the only thing they wanted to do. They rewound the videos over and over and over to their spot. They would just stand there, and they would ruin the videotapes and the VCRs. Okay? If the parents told them they couldn't do that, they escalated the behaviors. They cried. They screamed. And... Then they go to aggressive behaviors, then they bite their hand. And so, unfortunately, what the parents oftentimes did is when the behaviors got worse, 
that's when they pulled out an iPad or something, and they, I don't know what they did because they'd gone through so many videos, but they would come back and they'd just turn it on and say, you can have it back, okay, before they were broken. And so what they just wanted to be able to do is to not have the video on all the time, to get them doing other things, and to de decrease those behaviors um, when they couldn't have it. All right, and then they also wanted to teach them not to rewind the video all the time. Okay, so we had several things we were working on, but the main thing was to decrease the behaviors and also to teach them a way to ask appropriately. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show you. This is assessment. Okay, this is when we did that a functional assessment, and I said I want. This is a mother. Okay, and she is. We had to have them color coded. So Freddie was always. I can't remember which is which is which, but they look so much alike that we couldn't keep them apart. So I'd have them have one of them in blue and one of them in red for the day and then my students and I would go out and we could at least figure out who was who. So they look very much alike. Um, what I had her do here is when we first came in I said I want you to show me, I want you to go over there and they always want to stand in front of the video and then they'd fight each other because they only had one. Um, and I said just this is go over there and pretend like you're going to turn it off. And then as soon as they started to escalate the behaviors I would tell them just to back off and say, okay, you can keep watching. Because that's basically what they told me they would do. But I didn't want them to escalate to the really severe behavior. So we're taking some mild stuff here. Um, so let me turn this on. And so we are not in treatment. Okay? This is assessment. This is not what we recommended they do. But it shows you kind of where we start and where the behaviors were um, when we got there. <laughs> She's going to walk away and say it's okay. And he gets to watch for about 30 seconds. And then she's going to go back again and she's going to um, try to turn the TV off. But he's fine now, right? He's happy as can be. No screaming. Um, a lot of self-stimulatory behavior, but um, he's not screaming. Out. Okay, she's not even there. She's walking over. <laughs> Parents always wonder what I'm doing when I ask them to do this, but again, we take a lot of data and we want to see what's the baseline, what's happening, and what do we see, okay? Here's his brother, I believe, or I think this should be the same thing. It was similar. Do you see why I could really keep track of who, they, who was who? Um, so we just repeated that. All right, we did that for about five minutes, three or four times, um, so we could see patterns, and we saw that we got the same thing. Okay, it sounds like we're torturing him. All we're trying to do is turn off the television. Okay, not even pause. Okay, so that's the first.